everyone, my name's Louisa. Welcome to Dev Party. This is a series of online events organised by GDP Leads from all over the UK and Ireland. Whilst I'm sure we would all love to be having meetups in person instead of online, it's perhaps a rare opportunity to get to know fellow developers from all over the UK and Ireland, and maybe even beyond, rather than just those from your local area. Hi, this is Jen Ashley. We hope you will enjoy today and come away having learned something, as well as getting the opportunity to meet and discuss with other developers. You can keep up to date on our other events by following us on Twitter or Instagram using the handle at devparty underscore. You can also find us on Facebook and you can visit our website at dev-party.io. These links will be in the description below. So just to quickly introduce ourselves, here are the people who organized this event. Hello, I'm Mamta Gelani and I'm from GDG Lender. Hello, I'm Swapnil from GDG Galway. I'm Casey Nur from GDG Oxford. Hi everyone, my name's Oscar McCauley and I'm from GDG Southampton. Hi, I'm Jen Ashley from GDG London. My name is Karthik Nuli and I'm from GDG Southampton. Hi, I'm Asman Danawa and I'm counting from GDG London. Hi everyone. My name is Goran from GDG London. Hi, I'm Jason from GDG Milton Keynes. Hey everyone, it's Dimitris Garavias from Londroid. Hi, my name's Eddie and I helped put together this video intro. I have a YouTube channel focusing on open source. You can always catch me there. Welcome, Welcome to Dev Party. Party. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome for the new edition of the Dev Party. We did the first one uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and today we are doing another one only for Android 11. Uh, so today we have three really great speakers, uh, and we are going to learn and a bit more about Android 11. Uh, it's going to be a really great event, I hope. Um, so before starting, a bit of housekeeping. Um, so we are going to have three talks uh, today uh, and then 30 minutes of Q&A. Um, for the Q&A, just write your question in the YouTube chat and we are going to collect all of them. Um, and then yeah, we are going to ask your questions during the Q&A. Uh, we have a code of conduct. Uh, you can uh, see it uh, if you go on the, on the link uh, you see on your screen. Uh, if you see anything, uh, you can ask us, one of the moderators or, or organizer of the event, and we are going to take care of that. Uh, for the social media, we have two hashtags, uh, hashtag Android 11 Meetup and hashtag GDG Dev Party. Uh, because, yeah, uh, at the end, uh, starting at 6.30, uh, we have a party, uh, so you can join us for celebration and networking. It's going to be uh, really great. Uh, and also, we have a few prizes uh, for you today. Um, so to, to participate, to, to, to try to have those prizes, uh, you can tweet uh, about the event with the hashtags I just mentioned above. Uh, and you can win a Google Home Mini and also three uh, Android 11 t-shirts. It's great. Um, and now... So your host uh, for this afternoon, so me, Antoine Danois, I'm part of the GDG London with Mamata and also Dimitris, part of the Landroid. Now, I do. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mamta Gerani. I'm co-organizer of GDG London. Uh, I doubt we need any introduction for the speakers today. Uh, so the speakers for the events are Chad Has, Ben Wise, and Yasin Westgood. So let's get this party started. And just to recap, the agenda is going to be Chad going first um, on just what's new in Android, followed by Ben on modern Android development. And then we'll wrap up with uh, Yasin on uh, Android 11 privacy and how to adapt your apps on that. Um, 
we're then going to have some Q&A for roughly half an hour followed by the party, as we mentioned. Uh, this is going to be a bring your own bottle event, obviously. <laughs> And uh, yeah, first up, uh, we have Chet. Now, normally my job here is to introduce the speakers. Oh, there's one, <laughs> a wild Chet appears. <laughs> um, obviously, today my job is very easy. If you've ever followed the Android community, you probably know of these guys. Um, if you haven't, you really should. Uh, so yeah, first up is Chet Haas. He's the uh, chief ad Android advocate at Google. So Chet, over to you. Thanks. Uh, good morning. I should point out that I have coffee. That's how you know it's morning here in California. If it was afternoon, I would also have coffee um, or evening. Uh, so actually, you don't know it's morning. It's morning. Good morning, everybody. Good evening in London. Thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing the event. It's been frustrating as all of the events shut down and we could no longer visit everybody all across the world. Uh, in person. So it's really good that the online community uh, has organized all these ways for us to get together anyway. It's a little bit different giving a presentation in my room uh, as opposed to on a stage uh, in a room with everybody live and interacting with us. Um, but it is nice to be able to interact with uh, like the Q&A session afterwards. So I'll hang out after the talk. We all will uh, and then uh, please send in your questions and we will attempt to answer them. And if we don't know the answers, we will make something up. Uh, let's get on with the talk. What is new in Android um, in particular? Uh, so what is new? Normally uh, I give this talk once a year uh, with a couple of co-speakers. That's not happening because they don't happen to live with me in my small room here. Uh, but the talk is pretty much the same. What we have done since the first time I gave this talk in 2011 is we talk about all of the new features in the platform, uh, the stuff that we're doing for mostly for developers. Other people can talk about the users. Uh, we focus on uh, what we're actually doing in the platform for developers. We're also talking a little bit about uh, the tools, Android Studio and other related tools, and a little bit about some of the libraries uh, that have come out recently, the Unbundle libraries and what developers can do there, um, but mostly about Android 11, starting with user interface changes, my favorite. So window insets have been in the API for many, many years, probably 1.0, I need to check on that. Uh, it is um, the API that you use to find out where your app needs to fit on the screen. So what else is going on in the screen? Uh, what what are the, the constraints? What are the bounding rectangles that you have to behave uh, around um, so that you can actually fit appropriately onto the screen. Um, so for example, when the IME keyboard slides in, like, well, what is the bounding rectangle that you need to obey uh, now for your content? So that was useful, but it wasn't useful enough. Um, in particular, uh, we didn't give you information about why these bounds were changing, what the windows were, what the areas were that were taking up those bounds. So you couldn't figure out, well, is that, is that a keyboard coming in or is it the status bar or the nav bar? Instead, we just gave you geometry. So what we've done uh, is given you the information that you need. Uh, we actually deprecated most of the APIs, most of the generic geometry information, and instead um, added a bunch of APIs that make it very specific to the types of windows uh, that are actually on the screen creating those geometry constraints for you. Um, so now you can find out, for example, what is going on with that IME keyboard. So the way you deal with it is you set a insets listener and in there you actually get the insets object. There you can actually query one of the windows and say, hey, is the keyboard visible? Uh, apparently difficult to do over the years. Uh, and not only that, but you can actually get the geometry for that particular window or for the other windows that may be creating uh, geometry constraints on the screen at the same time. So the question is, why did we do this now? It's been in the API for years and years, so why now? Well, at least one of the strong reasons uh, drivers for doing this was IME animations. So this is um, certainly my favorite feature in the release, uh, partly because the developer community, uh, including internally all of us developers, have been asking for this uh, feature for many years. It turns out it was kind of tricky to implement because there's cross-process information about what is the system server doing now? What can the application do about it? How do you synchronize this information between all these processes? 
Um, and it starts with Windows insets, right? We have to know where the keyboard is and when it is coming in and what the geometry constraints are in order to deal with it. And once we know that information, uh, then you can actually synchronize the content in your application with the behavior of the keyboard. So as it comes in, you can be moving the content in your application. The way it worked before, I'm sure you all know, is the keyboard would smoothly animate in, but you would get exactly one event to respond to saying, hey, hey the constraints have, have changed, the insets have changed, so now you react to that. So then you get that janky user experience where the keyboard animates in, but your app content snaps. Um, well, now you can actually synchronize with the animation in, in a couple of interesting ways um, to make a more seamless transition experience for the user. So you can listen for changes on the keyboard as it animates in, and then you can react to those changes frame by frame by frame, or you can even drive the animation frame by frame. You can do a set and forget animation that, that just animates the keyboard, and then uh, theoretically your application would be doing a similar animation at the time, or you can go frame by frame if you want and do it very manually. So here's a screenshot from a sample that Chris Baines posted uh, that I would encourage you to check out. On the left, you see the default behavior for the keyboard where the keyboard, when somebody taps on edit text, the keyboard will animate quickly up. And then the application is able to receive those events uh, every single frame and then react accordingly so it can move its content, be um, smoothly reacting to the keyboard changes. On the right, we see an even more interesting thing where the user is scrolling the content up and then frame by frame, we're actually moving the keyboard in and then back out, right? So we're reacting, we're not even, it's not even really an animation. We're not setting and forgetting this animation that, that runs automatically. Instead, frame by frame, we're saying, where should the keyboard be now to react to this, uh, this scrolling gesture that we have in the application content? So we can look at a little bit of code to see how that works in detail. So for the sample on the left, uh, that we saw before where the keyboard animates in, you can listen to uh, the animation events as they are happening and then react to it uh, in your code inside this callback that you override. On the other hand, if you wanna do the thing on the right where you're actually scrolling the content of your application and then moving the keyboard step by step or just doing an animation to drive the keyboard uh, directly based on some animation in your content, then you can create this control window insets animation. And inside there, you tell it the window that you wanna interact with. In this case, it's the IME keyboard, obviously. How long you want the animation to run? We're setting it to be infinite because we're going to go frame by frame. This is gonna be manually driven. So basically the animation is going to run to be active uh, until we tell it to not be. Uh, linear interpolation, because it doesn't sense, make sense to have a motion curve if we're just going frame by frame. We have the ability to uh, cancel and get information about cancellation uh, and also to get life cycle events for the animation itself. So check out the sample. The screenshots came from the sample that I mentioned before. Um, so go ahead and check out the code and please enable this in your application to make all these experiences for users so much better than they are today. One of the big changes in UI for the Android 11 release was all about people. So we have a new conversations area in the notification panel where you can, if you have a messaging app or some sort of communication application, you can propagate information um, per user uh, so that the, the user can get back to conversations that they're having with people in their life. So, this comes from you know, years of experience working on the system UI as well as re user research, um, understanding that you know, clearly one of the most important things for all of us using these devices is staying in touch with the people in our lives, whether they're colleagues or friends or family or all of the above. Uh, you want to be able to get back to these conversations quickly. So if you're in the middle of a chat with someone uh, and then you go out and you're sending an email and then they get back to you. You wanna make sure that you can get back to that conversation quickly instead of, well, I gotta quit this app and I gotta go out to the home screen. I gotta launch that app and then click, click, click and you know deep links and then eventually I'm back in the conversation. Wouldn't it be nice instead if you could just tap on the notification to do the thing that you wanted to do? And that's what conversations enable. So we have this set aside area, it's top priority so that you got this conversations area at the top of your notifications. And then you can specialize information per person in uh, this area. So you long tap on one of these and you can tell it how to notify you about information about updates to conversations. And you can also change the priority. So maybe this person, this particular contact is really important. I wanna know about conversation updates 
um, on top of all the other conversations in my life so I can change the priority and then that'll pop that to the top of the conversations list. So the way it works is you set up information around the person API. This predates Android 11. This is actually an Android 10, I believe. Um, so you create information about each of these people in these conversations. You create a long lived shortcut. Uh, and then we push that shortcut. Uh, we have to use messaging style to enable conversations in the UI. Uh, and then we build and push the notification with uh, the shortcut ID that we set up above. So one of the things that we're doing around people and conversations and all of these changes is we're collecting a bunch of features to all use the same underlying infrastructure. For example, the stuff that we're doing for conversations works out really well with another new feature in Android 11, sort of new feature uh, called bubbles. So if you see on the screenshot on the left, you've got this bubble up at the upper left. And then if you tap on that bubble, it brings up the UI on the right. Now that is your activity or rather it's your application, but it's a mini activity that's exposed on top of the UI of the overall device, right? So you're not taking the user back into the application. Instead, you have this sort of inline way of interacting directly with exactly what you wanted to do, which was the ongoing conversation with that user. So uh, this was actually, um, as I said, it's sort of a new feature. It was actually an Android 10, but it was a developer option. Uh, it, the API, the functionality was not quite ready for prime time. We wanted a little bit more time to try it out with real use cases and applications. So we enabled it as a developer option so that you could play with it. Uh, but now in Android 11, it's actually a full on feature. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that we did this was there were applications that were doing things that look a lot like this. Um, and they used a really heavy hammer to enable. They used system alert window, which is basically a transparent window that rides on top of everything else inside of which you would have one of these little bubbles, right? We do not want applications to use that approach. So if that's what you're using system alert window for, we have a better solution for you. Please stop using system alert window and use bubbles instead. Uh, the, the interesting bit, I, I mentioned this before, is that all of these things sort of work together. Uh, it, it is nice when they do that in APIs, isn't it? Um, so we have the notification uh, API that I talked about earlier, and you basically use the same approach, but then you add a little bit more information. So you add some metadata about the bubble that you want to expose, and you also add information about that mini activity that's going to pop up when they tap on the bubble. It's important to note too, people have asked, wait, so now as a user, I'm going to get these bubbles all over my UI. The first time you uh, in your application propagate a bubble, the user has to opt into it. So it doesn't automatically appear in the UI. Instead, it is an experience that the user can choose to have or not. Um, but we hope that you enable it because some users really like this stuff, right? So it's nice to be able to offer it uh, when it is there. So the way it works is in your manifest, you need to have a resizable activity. That's the thing that popped up, the mini activity that popped up in the UI when they tapped on the bubble. Uh, and then you need to create the intent for that. This is the little mini activity. You need to create metadata for the bubble itself uh, with shortcut info that was the shortcut info that we saw earlier with conversations. Uh, and then we create the notification with the bubble metadata, uh, the shortcut ID. And so you're already creating a bunch of this stuff because you're probably pushing a notification anyway. And then if you're using messaging style, you have the person info there you're basically most of the way there to creating uh, bubbles. Um, so just go ahead and make all the stuff work together. Uh, there's a talk that came out with uh, all of the launch videos a couple of weeks ago called What's New in System UI. And they talk a lot more about conversations in general and bubbles in particular, uh, as well as the conversations API and notifications. So check that out. The sample that uh, has the, the bubble screenshot that's uh, we saw earlier is posted online in the Android samples, so check that out. And also we talked to the engineering team uh, in episode 140 of Android Developers Backstage, um, all about bubbles, how it actually works internally and how to use the thing. And then in episode 141, which is not on the slide, should be updated, uh, we had a conversation with the people who implemented conversations. Um, so also a good place to learn about how to use this thing and, and how the details actually work. 
So I would really like to talk about privacy changes in Android 11, uh, but I'm not sure I'm allowed to. Uh, in particular, there's a talk coming up. Uh, I think the next talk is going to be modern Android development from Ben. Uh, and then I believe Yasin is going to talk about privacy. So why don't I let him do that instead, instead of duplicating uh, what he's going to say uh, in a much deeper way than, than I would have covered it anyway. So one of the other changes that we had in Android 11, we, we feel that we do things for developers in every release. Uh, we do try to make things easier. I do not believe that mobile development is easy, but I do believe that it can be made easier and we're constantly working on that. So some of the things that we did in this release uh, to make things easier for developers include Wi-Fi debugging because frankly, there are never enough USB ports. So that was a picture of my laptop um, that is sitting below me now, uh, projecting all of this stuff. Um, that was about four or five weeks ago, and it's gotten worse, right? So there I have one of those USB hubs plugged in because I didn't have enough USB ports. Well, now I have two USB hubs daisy chained, um, and I think I have an extra HDMI cable plugged into USB. So it's a mess. It's a complete mess. Um, and you're constantly looking around for more ports. Wouldn't it be nice? if you could actually use Wi-Fi to talk to your device instead, and now you can. It's a little bit manual for now because the feature just came online uh, uh, very recently. So you need to enable it uh, in the developer options, and then there's command line uh, uh, commands that you can run to actually pair and connect to the device from your host machine. However, um, the intention always was to enable this in Android Studio, and there is an early version of that. I believe it's in the Canary release of 4.2. So if you grab Android Studio 4.2, you should be able to enable Wi-Fi debugging directly in the IDE. Another thing that we did for developers was nullability annotation. So we have been uh, piece by piece annotating the APIs in the platform to make it easier for Kotlin developers to get the information they need at code development time. So there's a couple of different categories of annotations that we're adding. Uh, one is recently non-null and recently nullable. These are the annotations that we add when they are new. When we're going to freshly annotate one of the, the common platform APIs, we will add one of these annotations. What this does is it says, okay, this is the contract, let's say recently nullable. Here's a contract on this uh, function, on this method where um, this can have a nullable uh, parameter. This can have a nullable type, um, nullable return type, whatever it is that we're, that we're annotating. Uh, but uh, if you call that from your code in a way that the Kotlin compiler can detect disobeys that contract, then that will be a warning in your build. You should fix it, but we will not break the build on your behalf. We're just telling you, hey, we added a new annotation here in the release, and you should know about this because wouldn't it be better to fix it at build time than to find out at runtime on a user device um, that you did the wrong thing and crashed the application. On the other hand, if we previously had a uh, at recently annotation in there, then over time we upgrade those things. So many of the things that were at recently in the previous release are now at nullable or at non-null. And this, means that if your Kotlin code calls it with the wrong type of parameter, uh, then we'll break your build. That will be a build error and you really need to fix that now. Uh, because yeah, again, better to catch it build time than runtime, right? Uh, one of the difficult things in software development is finding out why things crashed, in particular in the real world on real user devices. Um, so. We all have many devices, many emulators, many physical devices, and uh, we can do as much testing as we'd like, but it's impossible to mimic the, the vast array of situations that are out there in the real world, all the different types of devices that we don't even necessarily have access to, um, all the different kinds of applications that users can have installed on those applications that trigger different behaviors uh, and situations. So when users report crashes on their devices and you cannot reproduce those on your development device, what do you do? So we have a new API so that you can find out information from the system on the user device why your application crashes. Uh, so here's how the way it works. You call this API, get historical process exit reasons. Um, this returns a collection that you can walk through and then get information for each one of those crashes that did occur 
Uh, did it run out of memory? Was it some sort of null crash? Uh, was it an ANR? Uh, uh, this is a common one. I talked to someone on um, uh, one of the crash reporting services and they said it's, it's difficult to get information, detailed information about ANRs. And so they kind of connect the dots and they make some guesses and they can tell you, you know, maybe this was an ANR that was happening for the following reasons, but the platform has much more information about that and it is now exposing it. So you can call this directly. You can walk through these. You can upload that information to your server and take a look at the crash reports. If you have a crash reporting service, maybe a lot of this information is being reported already, but probably that crash reporting service is going to use this API eventually, hopefully use this API eventually to get even more and better information uh, for you. Uh, for things like ANR, now that they have access to that more detailed information. GWP ASAN is based on something that we've done in Android 10 called HW ASAN. Uh, it's all about debugging memory issues for native developers. Um, so if you're writing C, C++ codes, um, it's basically an alternate memory allocator that, that overlays uh, the, the normal uh, malloc uh, allocator that you're using but uh, in such a way that when you access that memory, it can check whether that access is valid. And if it is not, then it'll flag that and give you information about that invalid access, which is great for development time where you have the ability to have this extra indirection layer, this extra overhead on top of every memory call, in addition to the extra memory that it's going to take up, the extra storage size that it's gonna take up um, in, uh, in your application, right? But it's too heavy weight to put on users' devices. This was always intended to be a, a host side uh, development time thing. So what we did for Android 11 was we introduced GWP ASAN, which is a much more lightweight version of this thing. Um, it does the same thing. It overlays these memory accesses um, and it adds a little bit to your application, but it it's essentially the, the allocator equivalent of what we do with um, the trace profiler when it's in sampling mode. So not every memory access uh, has this overhead. Instead, it just does a random sampling of some, some of the memory accesses. So there's a very little bit of overhead. Um, I think the library that ships with your application is around 60K. And then there's a little bit of overhead on top of some of the memory allocations. Um, so it's a random sampling, so it doesn't affect your app uh, runtime overhead or memory overhead really substantially at all. But it means that if you scale that to your entire user base, now you can actually get real crash um, information uh, for memory problems that happen in the real world where it is tricky to get that information. Uh, and then uh, best part, the reports are automatically uploaded to the Play dashboard. So already when your app crashes, you get these reports uploaded to your dashboard. So what GWP ASAN does is uh, it will, when one of these accesses happens, when there's a bad access, it will automatically crash your application. And then that just, uh, it, you get the, the crash report and then that information automatically goes up to your dashboard where you can check it out. You enable it by saying GWP ASAN mode equals always. And then you get one of these crash reports that goes into your dashboard and you can look at it. ADB incremental is for applications that are really huge and it's really painful uh, and tedious to keep updating this application on the device when it takes so very long. So uh, imagine games, maybe there's a, a game that you're writing that is like two gigs, right? You, huge amount of assets there and you wanna fix one line of code and you fix it and you wanna see if it works. And now you have to wait uh, for two gigs to be pushed to your device every time you do this. ADB incremental only pushes the bits that are necessary. You can get up to 10 times faster installs, even faster if you're actually limiting uh, what you're sending down to the device even more than that. Um, the way you do that is you sign it in a slightly different way and then you do a ADB install dash dash incremental and away you go. So uh, in every release, especially the more recent releases where we're really um, uh, very aware of the privacy changes that uh, the platform should have to protect uh, user data and make it uh, make use make use of that data more transparent. We have these behavior changes, right? Um, they are. We understand it is painful and difficult to deal with behavior changes because you've always written your application this specific way, and then things change out from under you. So we're trying to make that 
easier to absorb with each release. And we did that in a couple of different ways in this release. Most of the behavior changes that happen in this release around permissions, uh, around uh, some of the interaction with permissions and all the user data stuff um, that you'll hear about from Yasin later. Uh, these are for the most part limited to when you actually do target SDKR. So only when you target this release or later will those behavior changes kick in. So if you're not ready to target this release yet, um, you do not necessarily have to absorb those. Uh, but um, there's also another way when you are targeting the release or if you wanna make sure that these behaviors do not affect your application, uh, we're making it easier to toggle those behaviors off and on so that you can one by one uh, make sure that your application is good to go. So there's a couple of ways. There's command line access where you can actually run a command and toggle that behavior, enable it or disable it to see what effect that has. Um, this capability already existed for some number of releases, but we also added a new UI in the developer options that you can play with. It essentially does the same thing, um, gives you much easier access to these behaviors one by one. So here's what it looks like over on the right there, or optionally, you can use uh, the, the enable or disable uh, commands in ADB to just run it directly. Um, and then you can see the little animation on the right. You can see it gets disabled when you run that command. Isn't that magic? I created this animation all by myself. I'm an animation professional. In the graphics and media area, um, there were various changes. If you are an NDK developer writing native code, um, you probably were never happy with the situation with decoders. Um, so we have a lot of powerful decoders for all these different image formats, JPEG and, and GIF, 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 um, and Keef and all, WebP, all these things, very powerful. And in fact, they actually sit in native code. We use Skia um, both for our rendering engine uh, as well as for all the decoding stuff. And all of that stuff is in native code. However, it's exposed at the API level only through the Android SDK, right? So if you wanted to access it from native code, you're really out of luck. You had two options. You could either up call through J and I and then go back down through the Java API to access the, de the coders, uh, decoders. Um, or what was typically done is people would just give up on that. They didn't want to do the JNI thing. And so they would just bundle decoders with their uh, APK, which meant that they were bulking up the size of their application just to handle decoding that was already on the platform. They just couldn't access it easily. Um, so now we actually expose this for, so for NDK developers, you can get to all the decoders that you could before, um, but from native code. So you no longer have to up call through JNI, and more importantly, you no longer have to bundle other libraries and make your APK much bigger than it should be. So here's how it works. You create this uh, image decoder from the assets. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you set the format for the bitmap. Um, you create a buffer to hold uh, the resulting information, and then you decode. And if you're doing 3D graphics, you're probably creating a teapot, because I, I think that's I think that's all that people do with 3D graphics, if I'm right. Animated Heath is about uh, extending capabilities that we already had for animated GIF files uh, into Heath files. So Heath um, image files are substantially smaller than uh, similar GIF files in many situations. Um, so this is basically a way for you to save on asset size. Um, and particular for the animated images. So just like the animated GIF files, um, when you load one of these things, if there's more than one frame, more than one uh, frame of information inside that image format, um, then it'll come in as an animated image drawable and you can play the animation. Uh, so it looks something like this. You create a file, uh, you create an image decoder from that file source. Um, and then not on the main thread, because that would be a silly thing to do because uh, this can take a while. Uh, you decode the drawable. And if it comes in as an animated image drawable, then it did have more than one frame of information in there. So it's going to automatically create this animated drawable for you. And you can start the animation. If you're an NDK developer writing native code and doing audio processing, then maybe you're using an audio library called OpenSLES. Uh, and we would like that to stop. Uh, this is essentially deprecated because we have something better. There's an open source library out there called Obo um, that we work on. It's for C++ developers. It provides high performance audio, uh, more importantly, low latency audio. Um, so if you're doing audio processing, uh, 
uh, or audio applications, you should really look into Ovo. It works all the way back to API 16, nicely unbundled library, so it's not dependent upon Android 11. Uh, it is open source uh, at the following URL, and we talked to the engineering team. We talked to uh, Don Turner and Phil Burke, who work on Obo uh, in episode 135 of Android Developers Backstage. So uh, go check that out to find out more about how it works. Uh, so since the dawn of time, or at least since I have been working on Android uh, back in 2010 and, and before that, um, devices have essentially always run at 60 hertz. There were some that ran at 55. I'm not quite sure why and, and what those were, but mostly 60 hertz was meant that you had 16.67 milliseconds approximately to do all the stuff that you needed to do and then post a frame. Well, let's say you're an application uh, that has its own rendering loop. So maybe you are a game, right? So you're actually using GL, you have a, a thread that's doing this directly. This is not this is not for people just using the normal Android SDK. You're, you're actually doing your own uh, uh, high performance rendering stuff. And let's say you're doing so much of it that you cannot hit that 60 Hertz on this particular device. You cannot hit the 16.67. Then you need to back off and only serve uh, basically every other frame. Well, the, the weird thing, the way frame rendering works is you don't go from like 60 Hertz down to 59 Hertz. There is no way to do that. These devices only uh, post a new frame once every 16.67, which means if you can't hit that rate, then you automatically drop in half, right? And now instead of getting 60 frames a second, you're getting 30 frames a second. So there's a couple of things that are enabled now. In new devices, um, they have rendering rates uh, that go up to 90 or even 120 Hertz, right? So really fast, really smooth, really wonderful. Uh, but a side benefit, um, is it also gives more flexible back off rate. So if you can't deliver at the rate that the device is running at natively, you can say, you know what, I can't hit that rate, but here's a rate that I could hit instead. And there's more flexible back off rate. So instead of dropping in half, there's actually uh, uh, rates in between uh, that may work better for you. So the way it works is you call one of a couple of APIs like service.setFrameRate, and you give it information about the rate that you would like to have and then the system will collate all the information. You may not be the only window on the screen and maybe somebody else is also asking for a custom frame rate. They will take all this information, figure out the best thing to do and then provide that frame rate for everybody uh, because everybody has to run on the same screen. That's, that's physics. Um, Thermal API is about detecting problems for NDK developers that we could already do at the SDK level, which is basically figuring out if there's a problem with the thermals, is the device getting too hot? Now, maybe you think you don't care, but in fact, you should because thermal directly affects performance as well as application stability. So when devices get too hot, um, then things start cranking down in a couple of ways. The first step is uh, the system will slow down the CPUs. Um, so there are probably different cores on the system and they can run at different speeds. Um, and that directly affects how hot the device gets. So if the device is getting too hot, um, then the first thing it's gonna do is make things slower. Maybe put the, all the processes onto a smaller core or maybe slow down the cores, um, whatever it needs to do to make the device cooler because you don't want it to overheat and shut down. And then if things keep being a problem, then it'll keep cranking things down you know, whatever that means, killing applications, maybe even shutting the device down. It's good if you can listen in on this information so that you can make adjustments in your runtime and what your application is doing uh, so that uh, maybe you can make an adjustment that actually prevents the device from shutting down your application or shutting down overall. Um, so this already existed at the SDK level, but you had to, again, make a J and I up call in order to access that. Now you can do it directly from NDK, from native code. Um, so you set a listener and then you uh, listen in on what the information is that is trying to tell you. So shutdown means I am too hot now and I am shutting down immediately. So if you need to do something with your game, do it now uh, or with your application data. Um, status emergency means things are going down. Uh, so this is sort of giving you a little more advanced warning. Um, things are pretty bad. You should do something now to save your state. Uh, and critical OS, like these are all just different levels on the way to um, really, really, really bad. 
Uh, but it's kind of nice to know, especially if you can do something about it, like maybe you don't need to do that amount of processing and you can slow that down to see whether that sort of uh, saves the, the situation a bit instead of having things shut down underneath you. Uh, then you register the listener. Uh, and then later on when you're done with this, you can unregister the listener. Angle is a uh, API that we released that allows developers to write OpenGL code, but it targets Vulkan under the hood. So typically when you use OpenGL, then it goes into the OpenGL driver on the device. But more and more device manufacturers are coming out with these um, Vulkan drivers instead, more of a performance uh, approach to graphics in general. Um, so we have uh, Vulkan drivers on these devices. Um, it's not enabled as the default driver. Uh, you can write Vulkan apps right now, um, but in the meantime, if you have OpenGL code and you want to see whether there is a performance or functionality benefit from using Vulkan, then you can toggle this in the developer options and use the Angle uh, API, use the Angle uh, driver instead to see whether going through Vulkan has some benefit for your application. Um, there are various other things that we've done in the platform that are worth mentioning. And an API, Neural Network API, um, for doing high performance uh, ML processing on the system, introduced a lot of capabilities for making it more powerful to develop with. So branching and looping and all those things that we think of as software. Um, so they enabled more operations that, it, uh, that allow that uh, capability. Uh, as well as some high performance operations like hard swish op, which I, I mentioned because I just, I like the name of it a lot. Um, hard swish op, I'll say it a couple more times. Uh, it enables uh, higher performance processing as well as um, uh, higher correctness uh, inference as well. Um, new quantization schemes. Um, they did a lot with uh, memory performance, uh, enabling situations where uh, the information doesn't need to be copied as much between CPU and GPU and TPU. Uh, it can actually share memory uh, and, and chain operations in a much more optimal way. Um, so check that out if you're doing ML. In 5G, uh, if you want to take advantage of some of the new networking capabilities that are coming out, both on devices as well as from carriers, there are some APIs that allow you to detect whether you are on a 5G network, whether you're being metered right now, and therefore, you know, is this a good time for you to use your higher resolution uh, assets for higher streaming to get better quality for the user and take advantage of all this um, cool stuff? So you can say, well, am I on a metered network? Uh, and if I'm not, maybe this is a good time to do this stuff. And am I on one of these fast networks? Um, and then let's go for it. For biometric uh, authentication, we added the ability to um, uh, to ask for um, more higher authentication strength and then authenticate based on that. So you can say, this is the strength of authentication that I want. And if the user has um, not authenticated for that uh, yet, but they have the ability to do so, then you can take them through a flow that asks for that authentication. Um, otherwise, uh, then you need to authenticate appropriately for some other strength. Um, Autofill um, has a really cool dual API, right? So we, uh, dual uh, UI. So we have this keyboard down at the bottom and then at the top of the keyboard, um, at least for the Google keyboard, you have these suggestions, right? So as you're typing things, it's suggesting, you know, did you mean this word instead? You probably hit a typo there. Uh, and at the same time, when you're when you have autofill, uh, let's say you you tap in a field and it knows what to do there, then it'll give you a little drop down UI. So now you have two UIs on the screen, both of which are giving you suggestions, slightly different suggestions. So we've uh, added the ability to integrate these um, uh, so that you can have all of the suggestions pop up in the keyboard. Now this affects two sides of the equation. One uh, is the keyboard itself. So uh, if you are writing a keyboard application, there's a way for you to get this information so that you can show that UI to the user. Or if you're a password application, basically the autofill uh, application itself, then there's a way for you to take that information and then send it into the system so that it can appear in one of these keyboards. Um, this is a secure system. We're not talking about sending the content back and forth um, between these applications, but rather um, the UI, sort of a, a higher level notion of what this content is so that the, the keyboard can then show the UI that which inside of which um, uh, has that content. So uh, here's what it looks like. So here, uh, maybe we have this 
email address, it detects that an autofill and passes it through the system. And then it shows up as a suggestion on the keyboard, or maybe there's credit card information or a postal address. On the keyboard side, it looks something like this. Um, so we have this request uh, API uh, to, uh, and then the response API. So basically, I would like to know uh, what's going on here. Um, and then you get back a response and that gives you the information uh, it, that allows you to populate the keyboard uh, with the appropriate UI that has the, the suggestion content. On the password side, um, you override the on fill request, you create a data set as you normally do, and then you uh, use that uh, to populate a fill response. And this basically creates the, the UI that then gets um, passed over to the keyboard through the system um, to show the suggestion in line in the keyboard. Uh, we've been working obviously more and more every release on stuff that doesn't show up in the platform. That's kind of a good way to go because then these aren't APIs that are only locked to that platform release and forward. Um, some of those areas are Jetpack. Um, so my slide says 70 plus libraries. I think I heard yesterday there's like 93 or something. It's well over 80. Many, many libraries in Jetpack. They release all the time. It's a little hard to follow what's going on there. Um, but there's a really nice release page that actually has uh, a lot of details. If you want to follow it for specific libraries, it's good. Um, some of the new developments here are HILT, um, the recommended approach for dependency injection uh, on Android. It's built on top of Dagger, interops with Dagger very nicely. We suggest you check that out if you're using dependency injection. Paging 3 is a complete rewrite in Kotlin. Uh, makes it a lot easier to use for Kotlin developers. It integrates well with coroutines and flow. It is asynchronous by nature. It is about paging, streaming in this data from a database into this recycler view. So the ability to use coroutines and flow um, for that programming model makes it a lot easier and better to use. Uh, App Startup is a new library. Uh, I think it's in alpha now um, that uh, enables faster application startup by collecting common information um, in a way that is more optimal for your application. So for example, many applications use multiple content providers. Each one of those takes a significant amount of time to spin up. If you're using application startup, uh, if you're using the app startup library, it actually pulls those into a single content provider um, and uh, allows you the same functionality, but in a way that takes a lot less time to actually start up the engines. Um, and then Camera X came out, I think, at I.O. last year, and it's now in beta. Uh, it is all about making it easier to develop camera applications. The UI, uh, sorry, the API is much easier to use, um, but also the functionality scales much better across a diverse ecosystem of both releases as well as devices in the field, um, because a lot of the the workarounds and uh, idiosyncrasies that you would have had to put in your application code are now embedded directly in the Camera X library itself. Um, and we're working on more libraries all the time. So keep an eye out on the Jetpack um, libraries to see what is happening there. Jetpack Compose is the new UI toolkit, uh, the future UI toolkit for Android. Uh, it is reactive, um, different programming model there that uh, we believe is much more intuitive and powerful for UI development. Um, and it is written uh, in Kotlin, uh, taking advantage of all kinds of language features there. It is pre-alpha right now, so that's why I say it is the future UI toolkit. Um, so do play with it now and give us feedback, but do not write your application based on it yet um, because it is pre-alpha, it is changing constantly. Um, we hope to, uh, to stabilize that sometime soon. Um, it is developed in the open, so it's easier for you to see what's going on in the code. And then also follow the sample and tutorial that we posted there and um, some of the docs. You can see what we're doing there. Android Studio has had three releases recently that are worth tuning into. The stable release right now just came out with the full release of Motion Editor. Motion Layout, which is a subset, a subclass of constraint layout, was always written with a tool in mind, like writing animation code in XML not for the faint of heart, right? It was powerful, but you know, unless you were the person that wrote motion layout, the library, um, chances were you, you weren't getting the most out of it that you could. Uh, but with motion editor, you can. So now you can visually set up these before after states and customize the animation that takes you from one to the other. Um, so very powerful, uh, check that out for good UI animations. Layout inspector was substantially rewritten to enable you to uh, have capabilities like being able to command click in 
on one of your attributes to see, wait, why? I thought I'd set that text color to black. Why is it blue? Well, you can see where it is being set, which was a little obtuse before that. Um, other things like being able to visualize your containment hierarchy in an easier way with a 3D view. Uh, 4.1 is in beta right now. Um, it has the database inspector, so you can see live updates both on the host side as well as um, the device side. Uh, you can go back and forth and really visualize what is going on with your data. And 4.2 is in Canary right now. So one of the things that's enabled is the wireless debugging to, uh, functionality that I talked about earlier. And also, if you do want to play with Jetpack Compose, because it is pre-alpha, we only enable that in Canary releases of Android Studio. So you'll need 4.2 if you want to play around with Compose. We're doing a lot in the games area. Uh, right now, so we have some SDKs out there like frame pacing and performance tuner for uh, obviously performance oriented game development. Um, new profilers in Android Studio and a couple of interesting betas that are out there. One is if your development flow, if you're a native developer and your development flow includes Android, includes Visual Studio, well, it's kind of hard for you to then adopt another tool somewhere else. Um, so we now have this development extension for Visual Studio so you can stay within your normal pipeline um, and yet produce Android games. Uh, so you can sign up for the beta there as well as the beta for the new GPU inspector. Um, so check out that URL. Uh, in Google Play, the main development, the, the huge development in the last few months is uh, a new beta um, Play Console. They basically completely rewrote this thing. It had been developed over years and years and kind of cobbled together and it was getting a little bit hard to use. So they rewrote the entire thing. Uh, much better UI, easier to use, all kinds of powerful capabilities. You can find out how your user acquisition is going. You can manage the team of people that have access to the dashboard. Um, so you can sign up for the beta at playgoogle.com slash console. Um, there's more information on everything I talked about and more in all of the launch videos that came out. So check out all the Android 11 launch videos. Um, they were all posted, I think about two and a half weeks ago. Um, so go to that site and watch all of those. They're a pretty quick view. Most of them are about 15 or 20 minutes long. Uh, 11 weeks of Android is a series that we started, uh, last week. Uh, two weeks ago uh, was People Week. Uh, this past week was ML. The next week is Privacy. And in each of these weeks, we're focusing on a particular area, mostly of Android 11, but also some unbundled areas or Android Studio um, or languages, things happening outside the platform where all of the content that we're posting, most of it is new, and it's all about that topic area. So we're deep diving into this week was machine learning. So we had content on NNAPI and ML Kit. Uh, and TensorFlow Lite, um, and everything from videos to articles to podcasts uh, to screencasts to whatever helps developers learn um, all of this stuff. Android 11 meetups, I'm kind of advertising a thing at a thing, like that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, there are many of these happening, so if you want to check out more, go to the site um, and see what other events are happening near you. And then finally, I wanted to put a little plug in for now in Android. Um, we realize that it is difficult. So honestly, on the inside, it's difficult to know all of the stuff going on in Android because all of these independent groups, engineering groups, product management, developer relations, partner relations, like all these groups are doing things all the time, pushing this great developer content, um, whether it's libraries, new releases of, of this and that, new tools, articles, videos, all the stuff is going out. It's a little bit hard for us to figure out what's going on on the inside. So what is it like for external developers? So every couple of weeks, uh, I go out and I, I scour um, what's going on internally and externally and try to collect the high order bits and put it together in a way that makes it a little easier to follow what's going on. Um, so this was originally a set of articles on Medium. Uh, it still is a set of articles, but then I take that article and turn it into a video and then we uh, scrape a podcast out of that. So no matter how you consume your content, it's pretty easy to get a really quick take on what's going on uh, in the Android world for developers. And that is it. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going on with a different talk now from Ben. Uh, yeah, that's right. Thank you very much, uh, Chet. Uh, we already have some questions, which we are going to leave for the end in the Q&A session we're going to have. Uh, we're going to have a five-minute break now, and we're going to be back at five with uh, Ben.
Hi everybody. It was quite one of the sessions which which you know leaves you with the head spinning. <laughs> quite good. Uh, so our next session is uh, related to the more modern and development. It's gonna go by Ben Wise. I'm just gonna give a little bit of introduction of him. Uh, ben works on Android developer relation team at Google. Uh, his focus is on making the Android applications compatible for the new app model. Uh, much of his time he spends navigating to the Android uh, app modularization and the dynamic features. And plus, he's also coordinate, uh, coordinating the Android GD program. So welcome, Ben. Thank you very much, Pumata. Um yeah, since we have a lot of ground to cover, I think I'll just jump right in um, and would like to talk to you today about modern Android development. Um, some of the things that I've been working on in the past led to, well, modern Android development. And we have talked about it for a while now, over a couple of years. And as you know, Android has been around for more than 10 years now. So it's good to take an approach and see uh, where we are at the moment and where we're going from here. But before we talk about modern Android development, let's take a step back and talk a little bit about classic Android development. Well, classic Android development is all the things that have, have led up to what we now call modern Android development. And specifically, there's four key things that I wanted to call out. The first is the language. Um, with the language that we had is Java programming language, which much of the Android framework is based on. And um, also, a lot of the applications have been written in that language, which has been chosen because it has an enormous developer, developer base. And there's a lot of existing free tools for developers out there that they can use in order to create their applications. There's also a lot of uh, libraries, patterns, best practices that developers can use um, in order to write their applications. So there's a lot of documentation out there already. And it has very robust automatic memory management, comparing it to languages like C++. Let's take a look at tooling. With tooling, we when we initially started out with um, Android development, um, as a developer platform, we counted on Eclipse and the Android Developer Toolkit plugin, which was freely available for developers as well. Uh, Eclipse gave a familiar developer experience. I had that when I was in university as well. I uh, used to work with Eclipse, and um, so for me, the step from this to uh, the Android Developer Toolkit was a fairly was a fairly straightforward one. Also, it was free, so that means that as a student, I was able to also start uh, developing with that without actually having to pay any more money on that. Um, it has a lot of integration with the uh, tools for the Android Developer Toolkit in the IDE, and it's, it was free. So a lot of developers were able to start writing applications for that. Let's take a look at the APIs that we had in the first place, um, or the like, framework around that. So in the platform, we had very frequent releases in the beginning, like really, really frequent releases in the beginning. And every uh, new release added new functionality to that. And we had, well, loads of bug fixes over time as well. So just to give you a bit of a timeline of uh, what we had in the beginning, um, well, the first release was uh, in 2008, uh, just before 2009 with 1.1, 1.0. Uh, After that, 1.1 came out very quickly, 1.5, 1.6. And by the end of 2009, we had uh, 2.0 or there already. And then we started to slow down a little bit with half year cadence. Um, and then by uh, 2012, we started to slow down even more to yearly and annual cadence, which we're currently at. And um, this is where we are now. Well, Android 11 is where we are now, but that's um, not the classic Android development anymore. But this is where we're going a lot more into modern Android development. With that aside, uh, let's take a look at distribution. Apps has been distributed as APKs as long as we had Android. And still on device, and that will, uh, still on device uh, APKs is what will be installed. So that means that is a thoughtless that a lot of the, the data that you create as a developer is then zipped for your convenience so that you don't have to bundle all this together yourself. Um, and there was one key issue with that is that everything has been sent down to the user and to the device itself, uh, to the device at the same time. Um, I'll cover that in a moment. So one of the things that you could do is you could add more configurations to your application. That would mean that you have more APKs or bigger APKs with um, more resolution, which also happened to be one of the uh, driving factors for increasing APK size is um, different device densities, so decibel densities on your device. I already talked very briefly about it, but I want to call this really want to want to take some time to call this out properly. There are some classic problems that you had in Android development. With um, let's get started in the same way that we just had it before. Let's cover the language first. With the Java programming language, it is a good language, but it is fairly verbose. Let's take a look at the developer tools. With Eclipse and the Android Developer Toolkit, 
it was difficult to customize from our end. And uh, the tools that we had in there had inconsistent UIs over time, as well as uh, the tools that came from other providers. If you wanted to use all those over, um, together, things didn't really look and feel very smoothly. So the developer experience wasn't really um, as streamlined as could be. Also, the core IDE wasn't actively improved in a way that we were able, and also we weren't really able to, to uh, join in on this part as well. For the APIs, let's take a look at the platform again. Uh, developers were very limited by uh, the users getting the releases to their to their phones. And as you know, it takes time for, for users to upgrade their devices. And back then, in that time, uh, we didn't have uh, things like Project Mainline either. Um, so for developers, it took a long time to actually being able to adopt new developer uh, new, new technologies and also the fixes of stuff. So you, as a developer, ended up uh, oftentimes to write your own um, workarounds or copy paste from Stack Overflow, this workaround, which was for this, um, this API. Um, and well, that's mainly because the users were stuck on these older devices or kept you kind of limited to these devices. Um, also, yeah, it was a bit complicated. So we had things like nice life cycle and how do you actually take care of all this? What happens if you out, uh, rotate your screen? And um, a lot of the applications were locked into just portrait mode or landscape, depending on what kind of application you had. Um, that was a suboptimal user experience as well. Um, also, storage was an issue. How do you actually save and read data? And um, also uh, tying into uh, what Yasin will be talking about uh, will be interesting parts on, on how we make sure that storage is even better for users um, by now and how you as developers can benefit from that as well. And another key thing was navigation. So what's up, what's back, and when do I use which? And also, how can I go like back from where I am right now in a consistent way? Um, all of these things were a bit tricky. So um, that's another of the key classic problems that we had. Let's take a look at the distribution as another key thing that we talked about in the first place. Uh, APKs are pretty awesome because they allow you to install your code and your resources on your user's device. One of the key problems there is a monolithic APK that can handle all the possibilities does also mean that your, um, your application just grows and grows in size as you add more stuff to that. Or on the other hand, you could have multiple APKs uh, using the multi-APK functionality. Uh, that would complicate your processes. You would have to increase your version codes, have gaps in between them to make sure that everything is aligned. Everybody that ever worked with this um, knows where we're going with this with a new way that we, that we developed. And everybody that has uh, that I've been talking to uh, multi-APKs uh, was looking forward to uh, not having to deal with this anymore. On the other hand, in order to uh, make your APK smaller for uh, specific users, or uh, we had we had flavors, we still can use them, and you still can. There's uh, definitely a very good use case for them, um, but that's also well minimal setup overhead. But there is some overhead um, in order to get um, your APK smaller for specific users. So, with all these things for um, the classic development that we had and the problems that we learned of over time from uh, you developers, from us internally as well, from well, the entire developer community as a, as a whole, um, we came up with an answer, and we call it modern Android development. Modern Android development, if you have been around for a while, isn't something that is brand new. It is a lot of things that we've been doing over time. We're basically tying them together in a way that we want to make sure that you developers have a better life out there as uh, using all the APIs that we have there. So um, it's development tools, APIs, the language distribution technologies recommended by us, the Android team, to help you developers to be more productive and create better apps that run across a billions of across a billions of devices. And it wouldn't be uh, complete without a nice graphic. Um, so if we take a look at this, uh, everything's under the roof of the uh, house of modern Android development. We have four main pillars that would be language, tools, APIs, and distribution. As I talked about this in the first place, and we'll focus on that uh, throughout the rest of the presentation as well. And we also do have the foundation on which everything stands, which would be the Android platform uh, and Google Play as the distribution channel that we are providing as well. So let's take a look and see what modern Android development actually is about. We took a look at the language, and we decided we are going to, uh, to look at uh, multiple of these, and Kotlin came along. So Kotlin is the recommended language by now. So let's see how we came from that point. Uh, in 2016, Kotlin was uh, going uh, stable with the first uh, 1.0 release. And in 2017 at Google I.O., we decided that we will now say we will officially support Kotlin as a language for Android. 
Uh, I very vividly remember the cheers that went through the, through the developer community there and through our keynote um, but from all the developers that were already really excited for the language and were just waiting for us to give the official support um, and say that this is the um, supported language. Um, last year at Google I.O., we said our development for Android goes Kotlin first. And just recently, uh, at the uh, first uh, when, when we, when we uh, set the first couple of releases for the um, for the beta release for Android 11, we also said that coroutines now is the preferred way to do asynchronous development uh, with Kotlin. This is where we are, and there's still a lot of things to come, a lot of things to uh, to be covered over time. But um, these steps that we've taken over the past couple of years have uh, led us to a world that is a modern Android development world for uh, for the language part. Why did we choose Kotlin? It is a expressive language. Uh, so you have to write less boilerplate, and you're going to be less verbose in the code that you write. Um, also, you have a strong type system with nullability at the language level, which allows you to easily um, have, well, make sure that if stuff, something should be null, then you can see that. Otherwise, it's it's not going to be, uh, you, you won't be um, having null project exceptions because of this. Um, interoperability is another thing where you can seamlessly interrupt with uh, the Java programming language and easily migrate from uh, migrate your existing code to Kotlin step by step if you want to. Um, also, structured concurrency is another key thing. So you uh, with with the coroutines, it uh, we allow it allows you to create elegant asynchronous uh, code, which you can also avoid having all those spaghetti code as callbacks. But Writing a, talking about code without actually seeing it is kind of boring. So let's take a look at a very very uh, short example. So we've got an activity on create where we're setting an on-click listener. And there's a lot of goodness hidden in here already. So if you can see the question mark at the bundle, this means that this uh, can be null. This is in the type system baked in. So everything that is marked with a question mark could be null. Another thing is that you have lambdas. In this case, this has a name parameter, which is the view. And um, you can has, you can create the uh, you can create a lambda directly and instead of having to uh, create a new onclick listener um, explicitly. This can be done like this. Um, it's already it's absolutely um, valid to create this. So the compiler will accept it, and you have to write less code here as well. Another thing is extension functions. So this is an extension function on string, which allows you to capitalize the name. So that we mean the the name has an has an uppercase in the first uh, in the has an uppercase as a beginning character. Um, and this is an extension function on, on the existing string uh, class. So you, there is no uh, no need for you as a developer to uh, add this yourself, but this is built in into the Kotlin um, standard library as well. You can create these, and this is a really good function feature as well. So even on, on final classes, uh, you can just create extension functions. Um, this is really a nice thing to do as well. Another thing is you have template expressions, which I really like. So you don't have to write, um, in this case, hello plus something, but you just um, have your everything in a string. You add it at, a, at the dollar sign. If it is um, if it has an expression in there as well, that has to be evaluated at the curly braces and uh, can put all your code in there. And this will be evaluated. And then you can see the strings as they are uh, being put out. So this is very, very more succinct than it would be in the Java programming language as well. And one of the really nice things as well that's built into the language is uh, the property access syntax for getters and setters. So in this case, um, we're uh, we're actually calling the setter through the property access syntax. So instead of saying set background tint list uh, with uh, uh, um, and then opening and closing the brackets, we just say a background tint list as like kind of the way it would be with a property, then equals and then uh, add, add the property to that. So it's again more succinct to read, easier to write, um, and it's less confusion for, for you to see whether it is a private or public field. Um, and this is all supported directly by the language itself. Another thing is, uh, why do we say Kotlin? Um, well, it's about development speed. So one thing, you as a developer, if you have to write less code, that means you can write that code faster. The other thing is, um, well, the runtime library consistently gets improved, and that is a lot faster turnaround time for new features to come in and new things that uh, are able to being deployed, not only forward looking, but also um, everywhere that your app runs. You have the possibility, for example, to take um, take coroutines and make use of them now on all the stuff that you've written now and all the things that already are out there. So even back to, well, all the apps that you you write written in Kotlin, um, you can you make use of coroutines, and there is no API level limitation from the Android platform. Uh, in the future, we're looking also at things like Flow and um, things like extension met methods, and the um, the standard library also evolves over time, and you can make use of those features um, as they come in over time as well. 
So with all those cool things, you might wonder, well, do developers actually use it? Um, so let's take a little bit about the uptake of the developers, uh, the developer community of Kotlin. We looked at it, and over 60% of the pro Android developers use Kotlin in their applications. And over 70% of the top 1,000 applications contain Kotlin code already. One of the things that we do is we also have initiatives around Kotlin, which are focusing uh, focused to help you as developers in the ecosystem to be um, to be even more productive rather than just the language itself. So for the tooling, we added lint checks. We added uh, we're working with a dedicated compiler team to improve the compiler uh, for for Android around, um, for example, the uh, symbol processing. We also have the R8 optimizations. Uh, we have annotation processing speed, which in that case would be the symbol processing. Um, and another thing that we also do is we are annotating platform APIs. So for the platform APIs, we had um, recently nullable and recently non-null as uh, two key um, annotations that we add to the platform itself. So that means that um, this has been added recently. The annotation means that recently this has been marked as nullable or this has been recently marked as non-null. Um, and all, as we roll forward into a new release, it might be marked as nullable or non-null. And um, that means you have time for about one platform release um, from to when we move from recently nullable and recently non-null as compiler warnings over to the nullable and non-null, which would be compile errors. So you have at least one platform release cycle in order to um, move away from that warning. So we have time to um, make, those, make those changes uh, in your application. And also another thing that's really good about this is that um, this is caught at compile time and not at runtime. So your users won't, enco won't encounter this, but you as a developer already um, take care of this and make sure that your users don't get the null pointers in there. Well, we even do more. Um, we work on Kotlin extension libraries, the KTX libraries. Um, so that means that all the things that we're working in on Jetpack um, also have Kotlin extension libraries. And also, we do these outside of platform releases. Um, let's talk a little bit about the things that we are doing there for what we're doing on the platform level. So. Have you ever created a bitmap and try to copy that over to a drawable? Well, that takes a little bit of um, a little bit of work to, to get this right, and also a little bit of more well, writing code that you might not have want to write. So let's take a look at how this has to be done. So we have the create bitmap function um, in the bitmap API, which well would return you a bitmap, and um, then you were able to draw that uh, bitmap with the drawable API on a canvas. Within your application, uh, you would have to write all this code in order to get the bounds, then get the bit and create the bitmap, then draw this on screen with the bounds. And that's a couple of lines of code. And there's a couple of things that can go wrong. Um, so we added a drawable KT, which is the Kotlin extension, uh, the name for the Kotlin extension file, which we added the to bitmap function. And with that to bitmap function, all you have to call within your application is, well, drawable to bitmap. So that means that the drawable that you already have you can easily write that to a bitmap with a given width and height. So instead of having uh, these lines of codes, you only have this one line of code, which is called to bitmap. One more thing uh, on this part as well for the initiatives is we add Kotlin spe specific APIs. For example, for Room and Work Manager, we added Coroutines APIs to make the asynchronous use cases simpler for you to use. Also, paging three is a complete rewrite of the paging library, uh, which is written in Kotlin for, and for Kotlin, including coroutines from the beginning. And on top of that, what Chad already talked about in uh, his introduction to uh, what's new in Android, uh, Jetpack Compose. Jetpack Compose is our new UI toolkit that is completely written in Kotlin uh, with Kotlin in mind. And we're even making compiler optimizations to uh, make sure that this works in a better way um, for you in the future. Well, we even do more, um, which is these are all the things that we're doing for um, for for you on the actual when you hands on write code. But also we do docs, samples, and training for you. So we write documentation, uh, which would be on the developer android.com side. Uh, we also have samples. Most of them are based on GitHub um, and also cross linked on the documentation side. And also we do training through code labs, and courses, and articles and videos. Uh, which have been taught partially, uh, so you can find those on Medium. You can find uh, those cross links as well here. Um, the videos, you can find them on YouTube. Uh, we, for example, have the Kotlin vocabulary series, which is about uh, foundations, fundamentals of Kotlin. I totally recommend you to take a look at this in order to understand some of the concepts in Kotlin much more in depth than they are covered um, in, in some, of the, some of the blog posts that are out there, because these um, are very, very uh, succinct and uh, very concise uh, 
videos with all that information on there on a very specific topic, just focused on a like, very narrow set of features of the language. So that's a lot that we do for Kotlin. So let's take a look at tools. Android Studio is the API of choice uh, for Android developers nowadays. It has the power of IntelliJ with possibilities to write code and refactoring. And also, um, it has built-in capabilities for Android, which is, uh, makes it the optimal choice for, for us to write Android applications. We're closely working with JetBrains to, um, to make, um, Intelli to make uh, Android Studio better and uh, working closely with JetBrains also uh, on, the, uh, on Kotlin. So let's take a look back a little bit and the history lessons. Uh, so in 2013, we announced Android Studio as uh, going forward the main uh, IDE for Android developers. Um, that has been a while, uh, but we already we made a lot of progress. So let's take a look at a couple of the things we did there. In 2016, we officially deprecated support for the Android Developer Toolkit uh, on Eclipse, and uh, also introduced the Constraint Layout Editor, which um, both were huge huge step forwards towards uh, modern Android development. In Android Studio 3.0, we introduced Kotlin support with uh, new profilers for CPU, network, memory, and the likes, um, which basically completely new UI built within the uh, within IntelliJ within IntelliJ's and Android Studios um, plugin uh, pl plugin framework. So that means that it uh, all was also concise and uh, consistent tooling throughout. We also added in Android Studio 3.1. We added D8 as the Dexter, which is the compiler for Dexcode. And uh, then there's new things that we added over time with navigation editor, also energy stage profiling for, for tools like that, um, that you can uh, make sure that you get all your stuff in there for your application and see what's going on as you develop your application, as you run the application on device and can see what, what's being taken in there uh, from the memory perspective. And uh, also we added view binding in 2020, which allows you to um, basically skip find view by ID and make this easier and compile time safe as well. Um, this um, avoids also the overhead that we had with other approaches in the past. And with Android Studio 4.0, we also added the motion editor. So give that a spin, give it a try, and see what's going on there. Um, and well, if you have feedback for us, then we'd like to hear that as well. So we also uh, had a couple of things for, uh, for Studio there uh, with code refactoring. Um, so we, well, we, we, and IntelliJ and Android Studio has extremely powerful code refactoring. If you already tried it, it's easy to move from uh, the code that is in a function to move that into other parts of that. You easily can extract a part that you've rewritten and uh, that you have written in, and duplicated code can be found through the heuristics in the in IntelliJ. So we make use of all those things. Um, also, uh, the UI, as we just said, for uh, motion layout and motion editor, for for example, also for navigation, uh, we added. Uh, we've got a possibility to add uh, new new UI features there as well, and the graphic tools that we have on top of um, all this is, is really um, just another level that we weren't able to do with uh, the tooling before we started using um, before we started developing Android Studio. Also, the core plugins that are in there for um, not just uh, Android, but all the things that are, for example, even if you use open up a, um, a GitHub project, you can see the markdown in there, uh, rendered and everything. So that's one thing. Also, a lot of other plugins are actively developed by JetBrains as well as Google. And on top of that, the developer community can uh, contribute to plugins as well that are um, easily integrated into the UI of, the, of Android Studio and are available for not just Android Studio, but also IntelliJ developers. And it, we have a very tight integration with Kotlin and Gradle, with uh, JetBrains being the, uh, the creator of IntelliJ as well as uh, Kotlin. Um, these two work together really, really well. And with uh, Google and JetBrains working on the Kotlin Foundation to make things better there for developers as well. So we have a very good integration for that as well. And with Gradle as a build system, we have a really good tool for you to use um, and have reproducible builds over time that we didn't have when we had the time with um, Maven files. Well, they were kind of, uh, well, they were reproducible, but not 100% supported. And uh, before that, Ant files or the uh, Eclipse run configurations, they were not really reproducible at all. So that made things really tricky. So now with Gradle, we have possibilities to, um, to have reproducible builds over time. And that is a huge, huge uh, thing. 
And also, we added a lot of lint checks and quick, quick fixes um, that highlight issues that might potentially be in your code before you actually ship it to your users. So all the issues that you find during your compile time, you don't, your users don't have to encounter them. And that's really good for your applications and for you as well, for the companies that you work for as well. And also, most importantly, it is very straightforward for us to uh, add the integration with new, with new and existing APIs, especially for things that are coming out that we don't have that we didn't have in the first place. It's really straightforward for us to, to add new things there. For example, for navigation, we recently re uh, released navigation 2.3.0 as stable, which has the um, dynamic feature navigator as part of that. And um, there's a couple of things that have had to be adapted from the already existing navigation editor. And these, ed these changes were uh, done in a, in a very, uh, well, were easier for us than if we weren't able to, to have all the tooling uh, around this from the IDE development perspective. Also for layouts that are there, we have the design editor, which has, for example, the split mode where you can see the XML on the one side and the um, the design of the the, uh, the layout that you have been writing uh, on your other hand, so you don't have to install it on a device every time. Also tools like data binding and room where you have database inspectors uh, directly in the IDE itself. So that was a lot about tooling. So let's talk a little bit about APIs. Um, as Chacha said, we have uh, about 83 uh, libraries for, for Jetpack at the moment. Um, they have been growing a lot uh, with a lot more libraries that you can be using over time. So we're not going to cover everything, but just a part of that. And as many of these, uh, as many parts here, we'll start with, off with a history lesson. So in 2017, we started, uh, we created one of the first libraries with constraint layout uh, in the 1.0 that we shipped there. And we had architecture components, which we, which we shipped also in 2017. Um, then over time, we added more uh, jet as Jetpack as a branded name. So before that, there were um, separate libraries that were floating around there. And uh, with Jetpack as that library, we had we added paging, navigation, and work manager as well. And um, Jetpack is our umbrella name for all these libraries that you can use that are unbundled from the platform, that are unbundled from uh, from the platform release cycles as well. Much of it um, is being much of the code in there is being backported, so you can use that. Um, Back, uh, backwards in a backwards compatible way as far as it makes sense for, for uh, the platform to run this. But you, do, you as a developer don't have to write all the compat compatibility code. So back before that, you might not remember the support libraries. And that is basically um, what Jetpack has soaked up. And Jetpack is a lot more by now with um, new and new libraries that came in there. Also, for example, the material and design components are on top of that as well. It's also a part of Jetpack. Um, then at Google I.O. Uh, in 2019, we also introduced uh, Jetpack Compose as uh, a development preview and Camera X as a preview as well. And this year, we announced Motion Layout and the Motion, Layer, uh, the motion Editor to use within Android Studio. So totally give, give them a try and um, let us know what you think there as well. One of the cool things that we can be doing and that I addressed in the first place is, uh, well, life cycles. Um, if you remember this diagram, uh, this is just the well activity diagram of the lifecycle. There um, gets more complicated if you add fragments in there and can get like very very messy uh, to to play around with. If you have to integrate uh, and implement all the all the callbacks and all the functions in there and have to make sure that uh, the state is in the right state uh, for for your application to do things, but you don't have to do this anymore with uh, the lifecycles uh, Jetpack component. Basically, what you can do is you can register a lifecycle life observer. And with that lifecycle observer, what you can do is uh, you get lifecycle events. So you have the on lifecycle event annotation. Uh, so in that case, we are looking at on start. And you can do stuff that you want to do once on start is being called. Also, you can check for uh, any other function within that, uh, whether it, uh, whether the state of your lifecycle is in a current state that you actually can execute code, for example, uh, started to the, uh, or uh, resumed, so your code is actually running um, when the user is seeing it, and otherwise it won't be run. Also, um, we separated, we made it easier for you to separate code from the user interface and the data layers through view model, which holds live data, which then can communicate back and forth to the um, to, to the fragments, views, and activities. And the great thing about the, uh, the view model is that it survives orientation changes. So that means that you don't pass data back and forth to objects that aren't there anymore. And it's really hard for you to make uh, to leak context and leak other things with uh, view models if you follow the best practices there. But it would be boring if we just stop there. So um, you can also use uh, live data to uh, query data in a room DAO, uh, in the room database, and um, you can use coroutines there to um, have code called asynchronously and give you uh, results as they become available. 
And if you have very, very large data sets, um, you recommend it to use paging. Paging library, that means that you insert that between room and your live data. So that means you only get pages in between uh, pages that are big enough for a user to consume and to display on your user's device in the first place. So you can um, abstract a data layer very, very nicely from your user interface through some libraries that work really well together. Um, so the four libraries that I just mentioned, life cycles, life data, view, uh, view model, and room, uh, are built to work really nicely together. So view model and life data are aware of the life cycle. So that means you avoid leaks and the updating data for inactive view elements uh, is almost impossible. Um, also, room can be addressed uh, and accessed through view model and live data objects. So that means that, um, like I said, you can uh, have this separate from your UI. And um, you can use, through coroutines and flow, you can keep the access to your database of the UI thread. All the architecture components uh, that I just mentioned are uh, friendly to RxJava. So that means that even though the examples that we have in here don't uh, assume, that, don't show uh, RxJava as uh, code, in code samples, um, they all work because we have the extensions there as well. Another thing that we did for um, for tooling is if you take a look at the navigation component, if you create a basic compo a basic um, activity um, in the Android Studio the templates, that will be built with navigation built in. That will give you a very basic navigation graph. This is the nav editor for this graph, which um, has a start, which is the first fragment uh, indicated through the tiny home over there to the tiny house. And um, if you click on the button, then you get navigated to the second fragment, and you can easily navigate over to the to the first again through the uh, through the button like through the previous button there. Underneath that, uh, we have the uh, XML file. With this XML file, we have uh, basically the same thing that you would see in the editor, but this is the underlying structure, so you can edit it uh, in the nav editor or in the XML file as you as you like to do this. And uh, you can then call the code instead of um, navigating and having to deal with the uh, the um, fragment manager yourself. If you want to replace a fragment, all you have to do is you get your nav controller, which is an extension function uh, in that case on, on one of the fragments or on the activity as well. And you just call navigate and add your action. And this action takes care of uh, everything that has to happen in order to navigate from one step to the second. And um, navigation also has possibilities to uh, pass nav arg uh, arguments between the destinations. So that means that you can um, pass data that you had passed in the first place through uh, through intents or what, however you set the arguments through the navigation arguments. And you have a possibility to easily create a, um, a lot easier create a single activity UI rather than uh, through fragments uh, because the fragment management is already being taken care of for, for you and you don't have to write this yourself. And one of the key things in there is also we created this in order to have proper UI, uh, proper up and back handling for you developers. So you as a developer don't have to worry what happens if the user presses back or, or up anymore, because um, through, uh, through navigation, if the user presses back, the right thing will happen in the way that it is recommended. Also, uh, recently, like I just said, is uh, for uh, the, the fragments, uh, for the dynamic feature modules that are on demand, um, we have support built in now as well. So that means if there is, if you're, trying to navigate to a destination that is in an on-demand dynamic feature module that is not yet installed, you can, through the navigation component, install that dynamic, so you can navigate to it. And if it's not installed, the dynamic feature navigator will um, download, install it, and then navigate to your target destination. That was it for navigation. So let's take a quick look at Work Manager. Uh, Work Manager is, uh, allows you to write the variable code, uh, which is, where timeliness isn't that important. So that means, for example, for analytic data, uh, that's really great. And also data that has uh, that has to be guaranteed to be run. So it has to be persistent across device or app resource. So it has to be able to um, escape the, code, the scope of your application's runtime. So you can run deferable and guaranteed background code with this. And um, also, this is not really a replacement for one thing, which is the alarm manager, but pretty much for everything else that you were be using before. Uh, so job scheduler is one of those things that you shouldn't be using yourself because that can be used through uh, work manager. Also, underneath, if, if you're looking at older API levels, alarm manager broadcast receivers are being used as well uh, underneath in work manager, depending on the API level. So we do all the backwards compatible ways that work well for you as a developer uh, through that. Back down to API level 14. We have support for periodic tasks as well as for chain tasks. So that means that one task has to happen, then another, then another. Also for tasks that have to happen in parallel. 
And um, you can define uh, constraints for your task to happen. So it has to be connectivity, it has to be there, or you have to have enough storage, or um, your, your device uh, is charging, for example. Um, so with the we have a quick use case for this that, we that I would like to take a look at. So you can filter a couple of images that, are, that would be um, parallel tasks. Then um, the next step in that chain, once those tasks are done, would be compressing those. And afterwards, they could be uploaded. And in order to write this, what you have to do is um, you, you override uh, you you um, you override a worker, and um, you cre you create you override the do work function. And in that do work function, you execute your business logic just before you call a result success as the last part. Uh, if the task has been successfully completed, otherwise you can call result failure. So work manager knows uh, whether the result has whether the task has completed uh, correctly or whether there was a failure in there. Recently, we also said um, that you can use Work Manager for more direct tasks that you want to run quicker than uh, at some point in the future. That is where we added support for foreground services. In order to run this, you have to um, create, you have to set a, the, uh, you have to set it as foreground with the set foreground function, add some foreground information, and you will create a notification on the user's device, and uh, the user will see that, some, that your application is doing something, and the application will run. Uh, the work manager will run in uh, as immediately as it can, depending on the constraints that you have set. Then you run again your work, and then you create and you call uh, result success. The last library that I want to go in for for now is Camera X. Camera X is uh, addressed to uh, um, addresses a couple of the use a couple of the problems that developers had with creating uh, pictures and create, taking pictures uh, through the uh, with Android devices. It works on 94% of Android devices with API level 21 plus. We have consistent output across devices, and it's a lot easier to use and to write code for this than it was before. So we have a couple of use cases that are built in. So use cases are preview as well as image analysis, as well as capturing photos. Image analysis would be for um, for augmented reality or for machine learning purposes, whether you want to classify images. Preview is in order to get a preview picture, and capture is you want to have a high resolution picture that you want to save this uh, on on disk of the of the device. And it's that easy to write uh, to take a picture with us. So you basically just say image capture, give me a picture in the resolution of 600 by 800 pixels. Then you build it. Then you um, use the camera provider to bind it to your lifecycle with the lifecycle owner and uh, the image capture in there. And then you just say, take picture. And there you go. And you have your picture taken uh, as quickly as this. And again, this is very consistent. And um, it's a couple of lines of code that you have to write rather than having to make sure that this works on a lot of devices yourself. We take care of this for you. So in modern APIs, um, just closing off that part, um, there's a couple of new things that will be coming out for modern Android development APIs over time. Um, and in this area, we say uh, very uh, new releases very frequently, which are um, with new APIs that are in development. For example, Jetpack Compose, Hilt, Paging 3 that just came out, um, and uh, uh, Hilt as well. And um, new releases come out every other week, and we have a very fast release schedule there as well. The last thing that I wanted to quickly cover before, before I'm completely out of time um, is Android App Bundles for distribution. Uh, we announced at Android 20, 2018 um, that Android App Bundles are launched. And uh, that we're using those as the um, at a key uh, distribution uh, manage, uh, distribution channel for for uh, for your Android applications now. So you upload an app bundle to the place. You can now upload uh, app bundles to the Play Store and can use them. Um, the users can use them on their devices. Uh, can can uh, the Play Store can can use the app bundle to give the device the right information that they need. One of the things that we learned what led us to this is that about 30% of Android devices have less than one gigabyte of internal space on the device. So that would mean that um, uninstall rate of applications is really, really high depending on the uh, device uh, free, uh, on the free space of the, on the device. So the more space a user has on the device, the less likely they are to, to uninstall the application. But that also means that um, if your application is large, then it's going to be, um, it's, it's hard for developers to, um, for users to, to Download that sometimes. So that means that the smaller your API, that the smaller your APK size is, um, the more likely our users are to install the APK um, successfully. So that means that they um, have enough data, they have enough uh, storage on the device, or that they actually care to install a large application. Put that, to put that a bit more in numbers, um, for every three megabytes that you save in uh, in APK size, your uh, users are about one percent more likely to install your application. Um, for and 
how, how this works internally is um, for a APK, the app would all where the APK would install everything on a user's device, even though it might not be required. With dynamic delivery in the app bundle, we have uh, very small. We only install the things that are required. So, for example, only the parts for the um, Rice CPU architecture, display density, and the languages that the user actually has enabled will be installed. So that means all the other things don't have to be installed on the user's device. Uh, we also have dynamic delivery, which means exactly that, that we only install the things that are on the user's device uh, that are required on the on that part. And we also have the possibility to install things later on through um, on-demand dynamic feature modules. We have about 500,000 uh, applications using app bundles in production nowadays, which defaults down to about 35% of the active installations, which means about 50% of apps and games uh, that are uh, that are out coming out there have uh, used the app bundle at the moment. So there's a great uptake for developers so far. And we're also seeing download size savings on device of about 20% comparing it to monolithic APK. Um, coming back to modern Android development, we have language, tools, APIs, uh, and distributions as our four pillars, foundation and play on this platform. And um, that is with language. We have we can look at Kotlin. For tools, we're taking a look at Android Studio. Uh, we have a lot of APIs in Jetpack. Um, and in distribution, we have the Play Store with uh, Android App Bundle. To learn more, uh, well, watch this at a very slower pace. Uh, also, take a look at modern Android development on the developer develop the documentation page. Thank you very much. And that is me about modern Android development. Thank you, Ben. That was quite informative session. Uh, so uh, for the questions, uh, just a reminder that we're going to take all of the question at the end of the next session. And Dimitri, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for me too, Ben. Uh, we're going to have uh, Yassine now coming up, uh, presenting or rather talking about uh, how to adapt our apps to the uh, upcoming Android 11 privacy changes. So I think it's definitely a very relevant topic these days. So Yassine, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, and welcome to my talk on adapting uh, uh, your apps for Android 11 privacy changes. So for the ones who don't know me, my name is Yasin Rezgi, and I'm a developer advocate at Google on the Android team. So the thing to know and to be aware as a uh, Android developer is smartphones are now such important devices for user uh, as they're holding their personal and private data on Android. Privacy is an area where we have been evolving over the last several releases, and we're continuing to do so on Android 11. So on Android 10, we brought changes in that direction for us to evolve our platform to bring even more protection of users' data. So today, we will talk about new enhancements in Android 11, such as permi permission changes, um, foreground service types, scope storage, package visibility, and data access auditing. First, let's talk about one type of mission. When they're given a choice, actually the users always prefer to share less private data with their apps. We also saw that many apps request background location access with no need for it. So based on users and developer feedback, in Android 11, we're bringing users more granular control over device private sensors, location, camera, microphone, and significantly significantly limiting access to background location. We'll deep dive, in, deep dive into the details now. Users will be able to grant temporary one-time permission for location permission requests. So what does that mean precisely? It means that whenever presented to the user, they will have this option, as you can see here, the same for microphone, to be able to choose while using the app only this time or denied. If they choose only this time, when your app is in foreground or having a foreground service, you will have access to that specific permission. So camera, microphone, and location. But once that is off, once, uh, sorry, once your app is out, is closed, that permission will be revoked automatically. And same thing here for camera. And the great thing there is you may have some apps where you can call, for example, the support. And rather than giving access to your microphone all the time, users will just be able to give it only one time. The good thing there for developers is 
by giving this choice to user, we will have way more conversion in terms of authorizing this kind of access because users will feel more in control and they will be able to decide what's more appropriate in this use case. So you may have this important question in mind. Do I need to change anything with one-term permissions? So in most cases, actually, you do not to do anything because if you're currently following the best practices on always checking if you still have access to a permission or not, it's just transparent for you. If you're not fully aware of that, let's deep dive and check together that. So let's imagine this simple app where the user taps on the location button. First, what we have to do is we have to check if that permission is already granted or not. And after that, we'd let the system check if we need to show a rational, so um, some details uh, giving some context why we need that permission. And after that, we may ask again the permission or not. In the case where we have to request the permission, we don't need to show a rational in this case. The system decided that it wasn't specifically needed. And let's imagine the user deny that. What will happen for us? In such case, the on request permission result callback will be invoked. So there we can see that in this case, it's granted everything's all right. We can just continue our business as usual. And if it's not, we may be able to show uh, some context here for the user. For example, Snackbars saying like, hey, uh, without this permission access, we won't be able to do this precise uh, feature or this precise um, idea, for example. So this is the usual code you're already used to. Uh, we just need to override the on request permission result. And if you would like to simplify this type of codes uh, as it's a really common um, type of code you write in Android. We brought activity result API, which is part of the Jetpack activity and fragment libraries. It's in their last, um, uh, their last alpha. You should check it out, activity result. It really simplifies this type of code. And to give users fine grain control, in Android 10, we split the permission between foreground and background location access. So applications are encouraged to incrementally request this permission to give users better control. So first for ground, then all the time access. The idea here is rather than asking straight, give me access all the time, the users should be able to see a benefit, a value on giving first the foreground access. And after that, we're grading, asking for more uh, broader access. That was like a recommendation in Android 10, but in Android 11, this pattern has become a requirement. What does that mean? So there is no change for foreground access request. It will be the same as usual. And in most of the cases, that's good enough. But if you target API level R, so uh, API 30 uh, for Android 11, you will have to ask first foreground access. And once that granted, you will be asked for, um, for background access. And the thing you have to be aware here is you, you can just spam the user because first, it's not great for them. They will dis that will definitely annoy them. But on Android 11, if you have to limit abuse there, if the user refused two times that permission, you won't be able to show that dialogue anymore. They will have to go to the settings and allow again your app to have access to background uh, access or even foreground. So here, really, the goal is to educate your user. You have to give context. You have to make them feel comfortable about giving access to location. But same here for camera as well as microphone, microphone rather than asking straight for permission once you open the application. That's not a good UX. That's not a good experience for anyone. So keep that in mind when developing. So yeah, page has a limit. Uh, um, uh, how can I say, sorry, the permission has a limit. Keep that in mind when developing. And uh, to ensure compatibility for an, uh, for application targeting Android 11, so we, we are aware that sometimes migration is not easy to, to do so. If you keep targeting Android API 29 or lower, you will still have that uh, background access straight from the beginning. But again, there is no need here to keep uh, expecting that behavior being always there, uh, it's better to switch directly on the next uh, target SDK, which is 30, to be a, 
to be able to enforce this kind of best practices. Again, it's good for the platform, it's good for your application, it's good for the user. So now let's talk data access. So we were aware how one-time permission affect developers. Now we'll check data access, which will help you to understand why did my app use this, uh, use that data. To get more context there, what you have to be aware is sometimes you may have comments from users not understanding why your application used a specific private sensor. So the camera, uh, the lo location, or something else. Why did they have access at that time? That's not really clear. So in this case, and, and it's really hard for large application because maybe you have different teams uh, in your company. There is a lot of code being written, thousands of lines, if it's not even millions of lines. And you may have some orphan code, some ghost code that no one actually knows is there. And because everyone is just focused on their own feature, it may exist, it may try to access one of those sensors, and you're not even aware of that. Sometimes you may be using a third-party SDK or library. If it's open source, maybe it's just the code too complicated, didn't check it out. Or if it's even more closed source that just works kind of a black box, it's hard for you. And for those cases, for those kind of access patterns, it may or may not be intended, and it's always it's not always easy to identify. So here, to be able to figure out among all of those dependencies, often code, but sometimes even your own code, we're bringing an API to help you there. Again, they're accessing in different ways, not really clear. So what we're doing here, for Android 11, we're bringing two new APIs to bring developers back in control of uh, the app's data usage. So the basic feature is a callback when data is accessed. So whenever you access one of those sensors that I mentioned just uh, previously, your callback will be called just before giving back those results to your code. And on top of that, we allow the developer to attribute access to logical features within the app. So that's the really exciting feature for me where one, uh, the first one on the callback, you will get precisely all the, um, all the calls made by your application. And the second one, maybe you may have like a really big code base and it's hard to figure out, wait, actually, which one did that? And we can properly tag each part of your code. Let me go through a, a specific example there. So again, imagine this is your huge code base accessing in so many ways uh, all of those private sensors. And that mapping may be hard to do. You may be trying to do some logging, but again, as I said, you may be using a third-party SDK. Uh, so sometimes you don't even have access to the code that actually calls one of those APIs. What we're doing here, the first thing is the, the callback listener. We just have to set up in this way. So within the on up noted callback, your app will be notified every time you access uh, this kind of data in synchronous calls. So if you ask directly for location or the others. And in case of asynchronous access, it's for example, when your app registers for a callback listener. So uh, I know there is like this kind of geofencing APIs uh, and that's asynchronous. You may get some notification this way. You can monitor both with the same method here. So for synchronous and asynchronous access. And for the feature tagging, again, is on the case of complex application, but you can even do that for a simple app. Nothing stops you to do that. You can kind of wrap your calls to location, contacts, or microphone and add a specific tag to it. Like that, when your callback, um, your uh, data access callback will be called, you will have the tag that is associated with the call you're doing there. But to be more clear, let's have a look in terms of code how it looks like. So usually all of those API are accessed through the context. Here, rather than just using the context that is attached to your activity or your fragment, what we will do, we'll create an attribution context and give it just a string as a tag. And when that is called, we will get that in our uh, on up noted callback. So we can check which attribution tag uh, has been uh, used for that. And the great thing there is if you have any call to these uh, sensors and uh, sensors uh, as 
we have a microphone, we have location, but also contacts. The good thing there is if you don't have an attribution tag associated with it, even though you tagged already all your code, it means certainly that one of your dependencies or SDK you're using is accessing that data. So you will be able to flag it and be able to properly answer to um, the need of understanding why uh, a data has been accessed to your users and also helping you to remove or clean your code as well. So that's really a good thing, and that's data access. OK, so now let's go to new foreground service types. So to provide better accountability for abstracts as private data in the foreground service, we've added a couple of new foreground service types, microphone and camera. So, so the great thing on Android 10 that we introduced with the foreground service types is we have sync media player, phone call, companion device, media protection, and location are visible as active locations. Those cannot be removed until uh, the, the code API is actually stopped, so until the phone call is stopped or the GPS, uh, sorry, the location sensor not being used anymore. And the good thing there for users is they are aware of what's happening. They know precisely what your application is doing, so it provides more transparency and users need that. Users are asking for that. So initially, those were recommended in Android 10 to, uh, to add it to your manifest, but now it's enforced. So you have to do you have to add them as foreground service types, otherwise, otherwise you won't be able to access them. And in Android 11, so if your target API level uh, R, you will have to do the same thing for camera. And you can also uh, pipe them and add microphone there too. So again, those informations are public, so it will be able to provide more uh, accountability. And when used, the users at least will be aware of what's happening on their phones. So to recap, on Android 11, if you need to use a foreground service to access any of this data, you must declare the corresponding for, uh, foreground service types in your manifest. Now let's move to package visibility. So on Android 10 and older, this API and others allow an app to see which other apps are installed on the device. So that was used, for example, to provide a custom UI um, and other integration. And in this case, that was uh, an API that has been introduced in Android 1, if I don't say mistake. So it's been always there. And on Android 11, to provide better accountability for accessing these installed apps on a device, Android 11 includes some changes to how apps can query and interact with other apps. So for several common scenarios, you don't need to make any changes. And let's have a look at them. So if we're querying the package manager to access other apps, by default, you won't have uh, any results because you didn't declare them directly. And that's protected by the API level. So if for any reason you're still not be able to uh, update your target uh, SDK, you're still protected there. So you won't have to rush, but I highly recommend you to do so. So if you're accessing your own app, there is no problem. You will have your result back. And if you're trying to get installed packages, by default, you will have the system packages and your own app. But you won't have the others and, uh, sorry, until you declare them in your manifest. But Sometimes it's hard to just try to think of all the possible apps that you want to capture. In this case, let's say you want to be able to um, send an implicit intent. So just doing start activity with an intent there, uh, like uh, action view or action send, you don't even have to add anything to your manifest. So for this specific use case, there is no change for you and just works as expected with a dialog box coming to the user. Uh, another example, it's imagine another app calls your app's counter provider and expect results. Without making changes, your app can query and interact with those apps too. So there are also not that much of changes. And now if you want to ask a specific app that you didn't declare, by default you will have a name not found exception, even though that application may be there. So here's again, you need to be transparent. You need to ask, uh, you need to set the list of application you're looking for. In this case, we have the queries filled in your manifest, and you will just put the package 
IDs there of the apps that you want to actually check to provide a greater experience for your users, for example. And in the case where you want to target all the apps that can answer this specific intent, action send with a specific mind type or action view with a specific URL domain, you just have to put the intent with this type of filter and you will be able to check all the application that can handle this intent. So rather than scrolling and checking all the apps on the placer, which is huge, by the way, you just have to put this intent field there. So in practice, we found that most apps can easily express necessary package interactions with intent and package declarations. So let us know what use case for you apps require. Query all packages. So this permission, we really want to be careful there as, again, for accountability, we don't think apps need to have this permission at all. But if you have a specific use case, just put it there and check for upcoming Google Play policies to know which use cases will be allowed. And sometimes checking which applications are installed was maybe to provide a different uh, user experience. Because by default, when you do action view and you put flag activity in your task with here in this case, Google News, you will actually have Google News as well as Google Chrome. Maybe in your case, you just want to show native application, you don't want your application opening browsers. With that, we're adding a new flag there that you can use without, again, changing anything to your manifest. Flag activity require non-browser. What does that do? Is by default, we will check if there is any app that can handle that that is not a browser. And if we can't find one, you will have an activity not found exception, and you can handle your UI in a different way. So you don't need to check and look for all the native apps that can handle your intent now, you can just put this flag and still have a much better user experience without accessing all the packages installed. And you can also test this package visibility with ADB. So rather than having to disable or enable or switch between different builds, you can just do that and check how your applications answers. Now let's move to uh, scope storage. So on Scope Storage, on Android 10, we introduced um, a limited access to uh, storage to help for better attribution. Like that application, we know for sure which files they added. So when you go and check as a user, uh, as a user in the settings, you would be able to know that this application added five megabytes of files rather than still being the same app size as when it was installed. We protect app data, so your app data won't be accessible if they are on internal storage as well as external storage, we'll go through, um, through the details on Android 11. And also protect users' data, because we saw that a lot of applications were just asking manage um, a read or write external storage just because it was the only way to access uh, the storage on Android devices. And we received a lot of feedback from developers. So what we did was to help application migrate because they may not be up to date on Android 10, we added a request legacy external storage flag that can help you to temporarily opt out of scope storage. And now on Android 11, after getting all this feedback and seeing how developers migrate to uh, scope storage, now scope storage is mandatory on Android 11. So first, the permission uh, seen by the user is renamed to files and media, which is a bit more clear because storage just sound uh, maybe a bit confusing. And when you target SDK version R, write external storage and write media storage do not grant any additional write access. So here you can start to remove those uh, permissions from your manifest and ask for less, which is great for users. Also, media store API and bulk edit access. We improved there to be able first to, whenever you edit or delete um, any media file, previously on Android 10, you may have to request that for every file. Now you can just do a bulk request, so you will have this UI and it will help users not having to allow a lot of dialogues coming up to them. The second thing is, we can also designate a media as a favorite. So we are bringing a new collection, it's kind of a sub collection within the native gallery in a, in a user's device, if they have a favorite collection that will be displayed there. So rather than searching through 
all their media files, they will be a, you will be able to flag some specific files based on user's request, and they will be able to see that in their native gallery. You can also put any media into trash. So this trash, rather than deleting them, it's a special collection that after 30 days, files there will be deleted. So rather than them rushing and deleting and after that regretting, users can park their files for 30 days and can still revert to that in case. In terms of code, how it looks like, so we're putting the list of URIs we would like to modify, and we send that to mediastore.createWrite request that will show to the user um, by sending the intent there, uh, the dialogue we just saw in the previous screenshot. And after that, we can just use an activity result uh, as usually, or use uh, activity result API, as I mentioned earlier, from, jet, uh, from the activity and fragment libraries that can help you interact more easily with intents. Sorry, yeah. We also bring in some restrictions. We saw that there were some abuse that we would like to limit. So now when you're asking action open documentary to see all the files contained within a folder, you won't be able to ask for root, download folder, and in, in download, you can't access anything. And that's just for action open, open documentary. If you want a specific file there, you can still use action open document. It's just obviously within the Android folder, any data or op folders are still private and uh, intent uh, and uh, set as internal storage for applications. But otherwise, any file on the other um, folders won't, will be able to be opened uh, with action open document. Another thing we find out is some of the developers just need to use the file API because uh, they may just be more comfortable with, or they may be using a native library, maybe like FFmpeg, where the only way to interact with is to actually give a file API object. So in this case, we're bringing a native, uh, a native direct file path access. But the thing to be aware there, it's using Fuse, which allows us to have a virtual file system. So it's just, it's kind of a wrapper of media store to be used uh, through the file API. So it's just a proxy. It doesn't bring more uh, performance. In some ways, it may be even uh, less performant than media store. So we always recommend you to use media store because it's our native API to access files, specifically here, media files. And uh, that direct path access is just there to help you uh, transition or if you're tied to a specific library to still use it. So open and first reads are fairly expensive that you have to keep in mind and performance impact depending on IO pattern. So based on if you're read a lot or go through a lot of folders at the same time, you will have to test and double check that in your performances. And we still see that some apps need a special app access, a way to be able to look at all the external storage without being tied to the storage access framework. But we don't think that most apps need that. In what I showed so far, media store and storage access framework covers most of the common use cases. But for file managers, backup and restore and more, we think not only those use cases, but if you have a, a complex and specific use case of accessing all the external storage, you can apply for this manage external storage permission. The only thing that you have to know, it's a special app access. So you won't just have a simple dialogue. We'll have to send an intent that will show this setting you're seeing now on the screenshot. And this your application will be reviewed by the Google Play team. So it's not an automatic permission that you will get that will bring some uh, uh, reviews. And you can still look for Google Play to provide guidelines for apps that need this permission. We still have some other important changes. I'm just going to go through them to explain you that we're still pushing here in terms of privacy for users. So before Android 11, the read font state permission covers kind of a broad set of information that users may not want to grant. So including general states of the phone, if it's ringing or idle, which is really handy if you have a game or if you have uh, your own voice application to provide a specific uh, UI. 
But there is some private information, such as the actual phone number of the device. Most apps actually don't need that. So now we're separating them in two different permissions. Read phone state, again, to actually get the phone state, and read phone numbers to get the numbers attached to the device. In this case, attached to the SIM card. So if your app only needs phone numbers, you may want to declare your permissions like this. You just need to request the read phone state permission up to API level 29. And above that, you will need to request the read phone numbers permission instead. So it's more restricted and more transparent for users. We're also bringing some MAC address restrictions. So non-system apps targeting Android 11 won't be able to access the MAC address at all. I think it's an important thing there is, if you need to identify uniquely a device, we have specifically advertising IDs for that, that you can check online rather than relying on something as tight as the MAC address of a phone. We also can on uh, you uh, non-system apps can only list network interface that have an address IP set, and we have the uh, APIs matching that. And application can no longer use bind on net uh, on netlink road sockets to be able to have access to this kind of information. So we have alternative for each API, and if you have any question, feel free to ask me after that during the Q&A session. One, and last one change, uh, we're restricting the developer access to your system alert window. So Chad mentioned some of that earlier. Um, if you want to provide a way, for example, to access uh, conversations on the go, uh, you can use the Bubble API, uh, and uh, you will have all the details there. And same thing there is rather than disturbing in a way the UI of the user, just trying to come up, we think that it's a special permission. And in this case, the user has to grant directly through the settings rather than just any application being able to do that. So that was all of the changes we brought on Android uh, 11. If you have any question, again, feel free to ask us and we'll be answering them during the Q&A. And afterwards, if you still want to ping me on anything related to Android, you can ping me on Twitter at, at YRESGI. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone. I think Antoine or any of the organizers will come back soon. Oh, yeah, here they go. Thank you, Asin. It was quite a uh, quite useful session today. Uh, so uh, we are going to start the Q and A session now. I know you go, all guys are very excited about it. We have lots of a question today, but before that, we have a surprise for you. We have somebody from Google today joining us uh, for the Q and A session. I uh, would like to invite Manuel Vincent. Uh, Android Developer Relation uh, Engineer at Google. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, how are you? Nice to be here. Likewise. Uh, over to you, Dimitri. Uh, here I am. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, as Mamata said, we're going to start uh, working our way through the questions. Uh, one reminder, I think we still, well, you still have time to keep tweeting uh, to take part in the competition, I think, until the end of this Q&A session. Uh, so yeah, as I said, we have a bunch of questions from the community, a few more coming in right now. But first, there's one I want to ask Chet. I think this is on behalf of everyone, really. Uh -oh. and that, uh, could you just please repeat again, how do you pronounce that image format? Uh, that's spelled H-E-I-F. I think it's pronounced GIF. <laughs> okay. Which which one? Heath? Uh, yeah, it was the GIF or GIF because you kind of said both. Yeah. I wanted to see on which side you... Uh, I sit firmly on the GIF side. I think some people sit on the other side and they're wrong, but I want to be <laughs> inclusive of all wrong opinions. Well, I think some opinions can just be objectively wrong, but... 
Anyway, uh, <laughs> okay, so I think then uh, Mamad is going to start the first uh, real question. <laughs> yeah, so we have a question here. Uh, if we don't make the thermal related adjustment, what de uh, what default behavior can we expect from the system? To what degree can we override it? Uh, I guess I'll take this since I brought the topic up. I, you can't override the behavior. The, this, the device is heating up and the system will do something about it. It's more about whether you in your application can do something to improve the situation. So if the system informs you through the callbacks, through the thermal API, that things are getting bad and they're gonna start shutting things down, then maybe that's an opportunity for you to slow down the processing of your application. If you are the one that is causing this through you know, game behavior, whatever it is you're doing that is taking up all the CPU cycles, um, then maybe there's something that you can do that will put the device in less of a panic state and therefore you can, um, you can positively impact uh, the state of your application as well as the device overall. But if the device says, I'm about to shut down because things are getting too hot, it's gonna shut down, right? There's not anything you can do about it. I think we prefer that versus, um, you know, just melting the device, for example. Okay, that sounds pretty wise. That was actually a question from me and it was because of some explosive behaviors we've seen in the past. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, so, so, in, London, in, London, in London, it's very warm nowadays. And uh, <laughs> what really can help from the user data, uh, from the user perspective is add an ice pack. So uh, I've had a long video call yesterday. I was outside, sun was shining on it. And uh, instead of turning off, well, instead of uh, when, when, once I saw the notification, I just well went inside, got an ice pack, and used the phone with an ice pack because that also helped. It's not developer friend, like not really developer friendly, but it helps as a user. The, the, I noticed something um, a couple of weeks ago where uh, my wife was navigating in the car, and and typically the the device holders in cars are sitting on the dashboard. Well, where I live, it's really sunny and very hot, and so you're in a hot car on a hot dashboard, the screen is on and you're using maps navigation at the time. It's like all the worst factors involved and eventually the device gives up on that situation. So there are things that you can do to mitigate the situation as a user, uh, but on the developer side, you just kind of need to know what's going on and handle it appropriately. Yep, yeah. okay, thanks for that. Um, Next up, we had a question about um, is Paging 3 a pure Kotlin library or is it an AAR? Well, it's two different things there, right? Pure Kotlin library, yes. AAR is just a packaging format, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think that's, I, that's, that's whether sure it's a jar. Oops, sorry, whether it's a jar or an AR, um, if it has resources, then it's an AR, um, but the code written for paging is Kotlin. Yeah, not sure about that one either. The next question we have is, what is the difference between Wi-Fi debugging and the ADB over Wi-Fi? Uh, I believe that's the same thing. ADB over Wi-Fi allows you to connect to the device uh, with a Wi-Fi connection. Um, which allows you to debug and do all the rest of the stuff that you would like to do with uh, with ADB. Uh, if it refers, uh, I think previously there were some ways to do that. Here's just like a first class support. So it's yeah. still the thing, same thing, it's just now first class support. It's much easier to do it. Yeah, I, I think people were toying with this outside of the platform and the tools that we offer, but this is the Android platform solution for this. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. So if you declare the packages inside the manifest that you want to know if it's installed, does the user need to explicitly gr grant the permission per app query or is it a runtime permission? So currently on Android 11, that doesn't need explicit grant from the, uh, from the user at all. But you have to keep in mind that uh, your app may be reviewed by the Google Play so um, it's not automatic. So by default, you can just do it. But requesting some uh, applications based on some Google Play policy, your app may be reviewed. Cool. 
Cool. The next question is on under 11. Have you changed something to have a facial recognition working better if we wear a mask? We need it. <laughs> Anybody can answer? <also? laughs> I'm not aware of any changes uh, there. For one thing, that's a relatively new development in our <clears throat> worldwide society. And Android development has been in development uh, much longer than that. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Anybody else is free if they have a different answer. You can train the machine while you are wearing the mask. So I guess that would help. Maybe so, the mask can use the, the, the recognition, <laughs> then turn back up. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know it's for face authentication, but uh, Chad mentioned we definitely improved in terms of uh, neural network APIs on Android 11. So I will say more for developers, train more your model to include uh, those masks because it's definitely part of our reality now. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a question for you on a few words, transparent masks. <laughs> I mean, all of the permissions and behavior changes that we uh, that um, Yasin was talking about is all about user transparency. So maybe we need to take that into account. Uh, also, I've seen that there is uh, you can buy masks that have your face printed on them. Actually, maybe that could be like the next type of um, forgery, I guess. Right, if you wear a mask with someone else's face on it. Um, people had tried something like that, but anyway, uh, moving on. Um, can you inspect encrypted databases using Database Inspector by providing private keys? I'm not sure. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> this is not my area. I simply don't know. Okay, no worries. Pass. Uh, uh, the next question we have, uh, why the 11 week wait instead of giving all of the in-depth material in one go? Interesting. <laughs> uh, so from what I understand, there, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is if we dump a bunch of content out there all at once, it's really hard for people to know what it is we did to get around to remembering later to come back and see that thing that they saw, or maybe they don't even know it's there. Honestly, one of the problems that we have on Android or any large development uh, platform in general is there's so much information and there's so much that people can learn that it's a little bit hard to sort of orient them into specific paths that they, they need to follow. And so to some extent, meeting these out piece by piece allows people to follow the bits a little bit more, but also uh, doing the 11 week approach allows us to then focus in specific content areas. So it's not just that we're putting it out little by little, but we're also putting it out in specific areas. So this week was about machine learning. So if that is a focus for your development, this is a week where you really want to tune into everything that's coming out. Last week in people, next week in privacy, right? So it, it allows you to focus. It allows us to help you focus on what's coming out. But also there's a physical reality of we do not have an infinitely sized team. We cannot produce all this stuff immediately and dump it out there. What we were able to produce were the 14 launch videos that we came out with a couple of weeks ago. And then in parallel with that, people were producing the content for the people week. And then a little bit after that, people were producing the content for machine learning. Like this, these are um, in many respects, some of the same people working on this content. So we can't do it all at once. We, we have to have time to actually come out with it. Um, and this seemed to be a nice combination of, of those. I don't know if anybody else had a, a different reason and just wants to say that I'm wrong about all that. That's fine. I actually, I actually think it's fair for, uh, it's better for the community to not be overwhelmed because everyone's always afraid oh, I may just miss uh, fear out just for more of our, that video just passed. At least here, we're just taking like a pace and anyway, you can watch the videos later. Okay, yeah, thanks for that both. Um, regarding uh, privacy, is there a way to monitor microphone usage by apps? So I know on Android 10, we introduced a way for you to be able 
to go to your settings, uh, if you go to permission, you will be able to see um, precisely the application which a recent usage of any permission have been done. So if they have been accessing your camera or your microphone. And now with Android 11, uh, I will say like the next step is to actively know, so to have that active notification whenever they will have to use the microphone by having that foreground service. So you can always check uh, on settings. Once in a while, I think we may ping you a notification saying, hey, do you know this app have been using your location or your microphone? And now you will have on top of that the active notification. That's on the user side. And then on the developer side, if you want to know if your application is using it, if you're working on a really big app and all the code is a mystery to you, um, that's where the data access APIs come in that yeah. Yasin was talking about. OK, uh, thanks. Uh, the next question, it is difficult to explore the JPEG Compose without a proper documentation, and the APIs are changing uh, quite quickly. How do you plan to offer the documentation that reflects the latest state? That's for Manuel. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is quite difficult as well for us, because um, if we produce a documentation, it's going to create a maintenance burden for the team, because the APIs change bi-weekly most of the time. So if we had to produce any documentation, it would be very hard to keep up. We are trying to do that with uh, JetNews, which is the, uh, an open source code sample we have out there, also with the code app. We're still living with those two um, content that we produce. It's quite difficult to keep it up to date. So whenever we hit uh, alpha, we are going to provide some sort of better documentation to help you know, developers ramp up with Compose. But yeah, n not at any time soon. So at least for alpha, expect like almost no documentation. I, I think the fortunately, the real fix in the long term is the closer we get to alpha, then beta, then stable, um, the fewer the changes are going to be. I think there's been a lot of churn uh, as the team has been iterating on some really fundamental issues. But as those get resolved, then it's not quite as confusing because they're not making such fundamental changes all the time. Great. Um, what shall we pick? OK, so when will multiple backstacks in navigation component be available? We do have a bug for this um, on the issue tracker that you can follow. And once that bug is resolved, that means that the next version uh, of navigation will have this. I think that's the um, that one answer. The other answer is we're actively investigating this. We're working on it. Um, and I can't say when this will be in because uh, we have to make sure that it works properly before we give it to you. Because one of the things that we're doing with unbundling our uh, libraries and our code is that we want to make sure that the stuff actually works really well before we ship it into a stable version. So um, go on the issue tracker, look for navigation and multiple backstacks. You will find the, uh, the bug there. Star it, that's another thing. Um, a lot of the teams that are working on Jetpack are uh, using the issue tracker to, prior to help prioritize their work. So if this is a priority of your application, then please go on there and uh, say that uh, at the plus one button, star it, and make sure that, you're, um, that the team sees what's going on there, that you're affected by this issue. Uh, the next question is, can you customize one, of, one source of a truth strategy, for example, like loading the data from room first and then getting data from the, some other uh, so data sources with the app startup? Uh, I think in this case, if I don't say mistake, there is uh, the the store library. I think it's doing doing it that way. I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, I know. Can you help me out here? Yeah, I'm not quite sure uh, about this question. I don't know the relationship between Room and App Startup. Um, I guess that you can access stuff from Room when, whenever the app starts. Uh, I don't fully understand the question. But yeah, there is uh, you know an open source library store, uh, which is uh, developed by Dropbox, I think, um, that you can use as uh, the repo layer. But Yeah, I think it's on the idea of fetching from the server as well as getting uh, from the database how, like, uh, how you set or server first or maybe like database first for uh, because it's right. faster and after that getting from the server uh, but it's not really an area i'm that comfortable with 
Yeah, check out store. Um, it's the, the open source library. That's probably the best way to get started there. There's a, a podcast that we did with um, Mike and Yeet uh, where we talked about store as well. I don't remember the number um, a few months ago. Thank you. Uh, what sort of support can we expect for Hilt and dynamic features? It kind of works now, but are we getting anything specific for dynamic features? Yeah, this is very complex technically because the way that dynamic feature works is completely the opposite of how Hilt works. And so right now you have some work around uses, uh, using entry points, but uh, direct support it's kind of complicated at the moment, and we kind of deprioritize that for for uh, the stable release, the first stable release. Uh, again, I think there is another bug for this. Uh, as Ben said, uh, check it out in the uh, Hilt. Is, uh, it's not the issue tracker. We have the, in the Dagger GitHub repo. So go there, and, and if you want like plus one the days or something, so that the team knows that this is uh, important for people out there. Yeah, this is also a similar issue that we have with annotation processing across module boundaries in general. Um, so th this is kind of the, over the underlying issue that we have to resolve first before Hilt or SaveArcs, for example, work across module boundaries with dynamic feature modules. Uh, the next question is, uh, notification log widget is no longer offered with the Android 11 beta. Is there any kind of user-facing log through access on a case by case basis for mic and gps uh, not a permission manager specifically here uh, i don't know uh, what i will say to the person who asked the question uh, the best thing is um, if you can ping me on twitter uh, i can follow up with uh, with the ng team there to to double check that's good thank you Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, just one second, making it here. Uh, so, uh, someone, his name is Miguel, has struggled using navigation component in a multi-module project. Are improvements in place to add better support for such projects? I guess maybe yes. you can elaborate also on how he struggled if he wants. Um, so just the, the short answer, yes. Uh, for Especially for dynamic feature modules, uh, we added the dynamic feature navigator library, which uh, just went stable with the latest uh, release of the navigation component. Also, the uh, Android Studio has uh, support for the um, for navigation with dynamic feature modules. I think when it comes to this, yes, this, this is all there. For uh, save arcs, that's an issue that we're currently investigating um, that will be a while, um, like we just talked about a moment ago. But in general, if you want to use dynamic feature modules in that part for a modularized app with um, navigation, you get a lot of these things that you would have to write yourself for free. So for example, the um, dynamic feature navigator library takes care of installing the dynamic feature module also for checking whether it's there. And it also displays a progress UI while the uh, feature module is being installed. We have um, uh, samples out there for the Kotlin DSL, for also the XML part. So all these things are in place. If there's any specific things uh, that you're struggling with, I'm very happy to hear them either on the chat, uh, maybe later at the party, or uh, Twitter, or on the GitHub on, a, on the GitHub samples. So we have uh, on GitHub slash Android slash app bundle samples is where you can find the samples there. So if you have issues there, um, please just uh, let me know, and we all can continue to investigate there. Uh, the next question is interesting. Uh, when do you think we'll be able to start writing the UI using Jetpack Compose? There's two answers to that question. You can do that now. Just don't ship your application, <laughs> right? So please start playing with it and send us feedback. Um, but I think the real question is, when is it going to be stable and something you want to ship? Uh, we haven't published a timeline on that. We are have been trying to get to that point um, as much as we can. Uh, just we did, right? So we did publish the, the timeline. Not the seems like total timeline. Will, I think the well, it's got approximately timeline, which is probably like in a couple of years and probably next year. But but yeah, like right now we are in a in a moment where we got, are getting a lot of feedback. So we really appreciate if you tried it out, file bugs, and trying to make the product better. And the the sooner is good enough, the sooner you will be able to ship it in Europe. 
And if you want to have a preview of uh, how good it is, literally, I, will, I always uh, um, uh, ask people to have a look on uh, Jet News. Uh, everything in Jet News is written with Compose, so there is literally no Android views being used there. So if you want to have a preview of what we can do so far, uh, really have a look. I highly recommend to check out our repo there. So just write Jet News on GitHub, and you would find it. I'm just checking out now. Great. Uh, the next question? Yeah. Oh, actually, something just came in. Let me copy it over. This is as real time as it gets, folks. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh, so, this is Are the Android Gradle plugin team working on something to make it easy to share test code between modules through dependency? I assume that's through dependencies. Um, um if it's about dependency injection, then yeah, we are working on something to make it easier. So at the moment, you need to use API to get the dependencies from another module. So we are working closely with the Android uh, Gradle plugin team to not have to do that. So in, probably we are trying to aim that for 4.2. So you could you could use uh, implementation, and then we will be able to um, grab all your dependencies in other submodules without exposing the full API there. And this is complicated at the moment at the moment because we are not getting the right metadata where in the implementation layer of, of things used in Gradle. So we are working on that. Thank you. Um, you want to go with the next question? Do we have? So I think some people have asked some general um, sort of let's say more uh, introductory questions about health. So maybe we could give a high level overview of, you know, basically who it's addressed for, what, what use cases it's, it's meant to cover, because I think for some people, it's maybe the first time they're hearing about it. I'm one of those people. Yeah. So, so health is the, the new dependency injection library that Google released um, Few weeks ago, and we are trying to we are trying to actually replace uh, our recommendation, which was originally Dagger, and Hill basically makes the whole BI process uh, simpler. So before Dagger was had like a steep learning curve, that's being like kind of flattened with Hill. So now with a few annotations, uh, it removes most of the boilerplate that Dagger comes in with. And so with Hilt, you can easily, you know, define your annotations uh, to see what should be injected and, and what shouldn't be. And in, with a few lines of code, your your app is is good uh, to to start using DI. So with this, I would say uh, disclaimer: DI is a complicated topic. So I would start first by learning why you actually need dependency injection. Probably a bit to know how you could do it manually, and then the problems that Hilt can solve for you. Thanks, Manuel. Um, uh, the next question. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate on the refactoring improvement? Can you share more on the duplicate code detection? Well, um, yes. Uh, in I talked about this in, in my presentation. So essentially, uh, well, IntelliJ has a very good heuristics in order to figure out, A, what kind of code has to be auto-completed, but also for finding code that has been written already and it enables you to easily just take code that's already there and refactor that through the refactoring action. So for example, if you um, just highlight a piece of code that you have written, like copy paste it a couple of times, highlight that, extract that into a new function, then uh, you can easily do that over multiple places. So uh, Android Studio will then tell you there's like four or five places where this has been reused and you can extract that piece of code, not just in this one position, but in multiple positions, even with parameters. So you will get in the end a function containing that piece of code with all the parameters that are required. And um, you can then call it. This automatically will be called for you in the places where the code was before. That sounds really cool. Thanks. Um, I think that was the last question we had. And I think it's also, I don't know about you, for me personally, it's definitely beer o'clock. So part time, the link is also in the live chat on the YouTube stream. So folks, feel free to uh, join the party right now. Thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, and our surprise speaker in the end, Manuel. Uh, 
it was all really fantastic content. It was a real pleasure having you. And uh, yeah, see you at the party. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.